things like that with such audacity. Like, please, give me some of the audacity that you have. It overflows your audacity. My name is Hannah. Welcome back to my second channel, Hannah Needs to Yell, and today I need to yell about the return of Creepshow art again. Before watching this video, it's a very good idea to prep yourself by watching Emily's video. Creepshow art has always been this way, which she published on June 12th of 2021, or a summary of it. If it is not already fresh in your mind, it's very helpful context to have to this video. I also recommend watching my prior videos that I have made on this subject, especially the most recent video that I posted that was a prologue to this video video. In that video, I spend some time summarizing Emily's video and going into the background of this situation, as well as some important things that this video is not going to address. The purpose of today's video is to compare Emily Artful's video from June 2021, in which she calls out her ex-boyfriend, Anthony Parker, and his wife, Shannon from Creepshow Art, for allegedly stalking and harassing her for about five years, with Anthony and Shannon's response video from December 31st of 2021, which they say they made simply to defend themselves and prove that they did not do the things that they were accused of. Spoiler alert, that doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm sure you already know this video is going to be very long. You have my full blessing to set it to one and a half times speed or double speed. Use the timestamps, watch it in parts, take breaks. Whatever helps you get through the whole thing. But I think there is value in every section of this video as we respond to every section of Shannon's video. So I encourage you to watch the whole thing. Shannon and Anthony's video was also a little bit chaotic. But as scattered as their video is, we can see some patterns emerging from it. Anthony and Shannon seem to love to manipulate the viewer by leaving out important information, put words in Emily's mouth so that they can go about a tedious process to disprove them, and purposefully miss the point of what Emily is saying, and instead focus on some tiny detail and turn that into an opportunity to embarrass Emily by showing off some dirt from her past. All three of these patterns aim to manipulate the viewer's perception of this situation and rely on the assumption that their viewers won't take the time to do what I am doing today. To go back to Emily's video and realize, oh wait, these two things do not line up. I need to put a massive trigger warning right here. This whole video is going to be full of like every kind of trigger. There will be mentions or discussions of drug addiction, rape, eating disorders, mental health struggles, manipulation, abusive partners, basically anything you can think of is probably in this video somewhere. So if that is difficult for you, then this situation is not for you. This is a good time for you to exit. Go in peace, my friend. If there's anything that I miss or get wrong, please do not hesitate to mention it in the comments below. If you're enjoying what you're seeing, please consider giving this video a like and subscribing to my channel and setting the notifications to all. I upload to this channel kind of sporadically, so if you like this video, you will want to be notified of when the next one comes. All right, is everybody ready? Do you have a drink? Do you have a snack? Are you cozy? Are you ready to settle in? All right, let's dive in. Intro. The intro of this video with its opening statement and really official seeming tone really tries to set the precedent that the whole video is legally sound, backed by her lawyers, signed, sealed, delivered, and therefore full of rock solid proof. However, from the beginning, the very first couple of sentences, we can tell that this whole opening and the tone that it sets is merely a mirage. It looks like something it's not. In reality, there's nothing there. Shannon starts off by reading us an opening statement, which she also scrolls on the screen so we can read along with her. How thoughtful, Shannon, thank you. 
Anthony and Shannon start off by saying that if we are seeing this video, it means that either her lawyers have negotiated with Emily and they have reached some sort of settlement that involves some sort of retraction, or two, she took Emily to court for defamation and came out the other side. Right off the bat, I have so many thoughts. <laughs> First of all, we know that this is a lie because Emily has Twitter. Upon watching this video, Emily quickly tweeted that Anthony and Shannon had not filed a lawsuit against her, just threatened to do so if she didn't take down every mention of them from her channel without explanation, which Emily did not do. So right off the bat, we are building this whole video on <laughs> falsehood. But let's pretend that we had not seen that tweet, so we don't know that Shannon is lying here. Either way, one, if their lawyers negotiated and they reached some type of private settlement resulting in some retraction, Who's retracting something? Emily hasn't taken down her videos about Shannon and Anthony allegedly harassing her. And if anything, this video is Anthony and Shannon adding to the story, not retracting anything. This leads me to option two. And I absolutely love that option two is that they took Emily to court for defamation and came out the other side. Not that Shannon won, but just that she survived the case. I did not need Emily's tweet saying that this wasn't true in order to know that it wasn't true <laughs> because if Shannon or Emily had taken the other to court, there would have been a huge buzz about it among commentary YouTubers. Emily D. Baker, hello. I would love to see her coverage of a case <laughs> with creep show art. I know that Shannon is saying here that one of these two things must have happened, but there is no evidence of either one taking place. I don't know why Anthony and Shannon thought that we wouldn't notice that. They really underestimate the intelligence of their audience consistently throughout this video. Next up, Shannon says, this video is being made for posterity, to show that she didn't do what she was accused of, and to show that what Emily has accused her and her husband of not only never happened, but could not have happened. This video is being made simply to defend her and her husband's name and prove that they did not do the things they were accused of. Let's pause and read that again. This video is being made for posterity to show that she didn't do what she was accused of and to show that what Emily accused her and her husband of not only never happened, but could not have happened. So making Emily think that her life experiences never happened. Do we have a definition of gaslighting I can pull up here real quick? Um, the Oxford English Dictionary says gaslighting to manipulate someone by psychological means into questioning their own sanity. Okay, okay, what else? Wikipedia says gaslighting is a colloquialism loosely defined as making someone question their own reality. The term may also be used to describe a person who presents a false narrative to another group or person, which leads them to doubt their perceptions and become misled, disoriented, or distressed. Okay, interesting. Just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page about that. Anyway. Anthony and Shannon also provide us with a few structural notes here at the beginning. They will be going through Emily's video point by point to provide evidence that Emily has lied about them. Spoiler alert, they don't really do that. And they will leave links in the description box so we can verify the authenticity of everything she's saying. Thank you, Shannon, how thoughtful. And there are links to tons of videos in the description and a Google Doc that contains her script for this video with links to Emily's various social media accounts that she cited in this video. I love that she provided all her proof for us to look at ourselves, super thoughtful and um, Oh, never mind. I, I, I guess they changed their minds about making available the evidence that supposedly clears their names. So, um, Hey everybody, want to know something cool and funky fresh and ha ha hilarious? Um, I went back to Shannon's video today to try to record a screen recording of what I just showed you instead of that screenshot from January 10th of the Google Doc not being available. And here's that screen recording. As you can see, it is now available. So 
I don't know why for a certain period of time when I clicked on that link, that's the page that it brought me to. I don't know if the link changed or what, but I find it f -f -f fascinating. And also now whatever this document is, is available. I wonder if it's a different version of it. And maybe they made some corrections or changes between the prior version that they took down and this one or something like that. All I know is something changed here. Something happened. I guess we'll just go off what they show in the video because we can trust them 100%. Anthony and Shannon then proceed to make three claims back to back that seem to contradict each other. First, they say that 99% of the evidence in this video came from publicly accessible social media accounts. Next, they say that Emily had access to proof that actively went against her claims, but she hid it in order to slander Shannon and Anthony. So I'm just checking, was the proof publicly available or was it hidden by Emily? I, I'm just dumb taking notes. In between those two, Anthony and Shannon argue that Emily's claim that Shannon is her stalker is a safeguard so that when they bring out all the receipts they've found, Emily can point at that and call it evidence of stalking. And in a way, they're kind of right about this. People are saying exactly that in response to this video from them. However, I don't think it's for the reason that Anthony and Shannon think it is. If their receipts actually debunked Emily's claims, I think people would like respect their investigative abilities and see them as like going all out, balls to the wall to defend themselves. However, since a lot of the receipts they provide don't debunk Emily's allegations and are pulled from Emily's childhood accounts. That's why people are calling them stalkers. I believe them when they say that all of the evidence that they gathered was gathered after Emily posted their video because I cross-referenced a lot of the screenshots that Shannon showed in her video, not every single one, but a lot of them with a calendar. <laughs> and most of them are dated in a way that shows that she took these screenshots between June 12th, 2021 and December 31st when she published this video. I'm not necessarily of the belief that Shannon has been stockpiling these screenshots and receipts over the past five, seven years, but because she spent the past six months scrambling around in 12 year old Facebook profiles, grabbing at any scrap of a sentence that can be squished and molded and shaped to kind of fit the narrative that she's trying to build, that's what is making her and Anthony look a little unhinged. The rest of her opening statement mentions Tipster, Shannon's sibling, Jem Campbell, and Shannon's former friend, Loki Coulter, who she refers to by their dead name and wrong pronouns during this whole video. We already discussed Tipster in my prior video on this topic, so you already know that he is discussed more at the end of this whole video. Similarly, Shannon makes some pretty heavy claims against Jem and Loki here at the beginning of the video, but since she also has sections dedicated to them at the end of the video, I will bring this point back up when I get there. So as you can tell, Anthony and Shannon's video is already a little all over the place. The main takeaways for us from this intro is just that Shannon and Anthony are making this video to clear their names, prove that the allegations against them are wrong, and prove that they never could have happened. However, even if they were right about all of those things, they're still not in the clear here. My first time watching Anthony and Shannon's video all the way through, I wrote this note. Trying to debunk Emily's stalking claims was never and is never going to be enough to bring Creepshow art back to the internet. Even if you remove Emily's story from the situation entirely, there is still enough problematic stuff with the lol cow situation to cancel Shannon for a very long time, if not permanently. She clearly has no intention to make amends with her audience, just to save her own skin. And with that, Let's move on to part one. Just popping in with a palette cleanser of this footage of my kitten Jupiter. He's just a few months old. He is living his best life sitting on my chair, being warmed by my box lights, giving himself a little bath, and he's oblivious to all of this going on. I understand that my video may be stressing you out so far, so I hope that you just take a minute Look at Jupiter and just relax hanging out with Jupiter for a second. If you need a pause, go get a snack, go refill your drink. 
this is a great time to do that. And then when you're ready, come on back and we'll start part one. Cause shit's about to get wild. Part one and two, the relationship and 2012 heroin. So part one and part two make up the next 26 minutes of Shannon's video, but I'm putting them together in the same segment of my video because they build upon each other. It's a little bit difficult to follow these two sections, but that's because this whole time Shannon is hell-bent on proving an irrelevant point. This is the point in the video when Anthony and Shannon start responding to Emily's video, kind of reaction style along the timeline of her video in the order that she brings things up. Just watching Anthony and Shannon's video without watching Emily's video alongside it, it's like listening to Anthony and Shannon answer a bunch of questions that you can't hear. Because you can't hear the question that they're being asked, they can phrase their answer in such a way that makes you think they're being asked a different question than they really are. It felt like everything Anthony and Shannon were saying was unrelated to what Emily had said. So it just felt like this hit piece on Emily. However, upon re-watching it all while I wrote my script and notes for this video, I think I do see a method to Shannon's madness here. Hang in there and move through this with me. You'll see what I mean. Part one, the relationship. Because Shannon and Anthony provide no context for this section, <laughs> uh, let me start by recapping what Emily says about her relationship with Anthony. I will read aloud a lot of notes and I'll put the timestamps up on the screen for you. Emily says, Anthony Parker, who is also my abusive ex Partner. His handle online is Anthony Parker and he raped me and he emotionally abused me and manipulated me when I was most vulnerable and for the better part of the decade he tried to make my life a living hell. I've struggled with addiction since I was about 14 years old. I am seven years sober. I don't have an official sober birthday anymore because there were a few instances of relapse back then. I also struggled with an eating disorder and some pretty serious mental health issues. The beginning timeline is a little bit hazy just because you know drugs so um, I was somewhere between 18 and 20. Um, I took a gig performing at Nickel City Arcade in San Jose. And Andrew was there with some friends. We ended up hitting it off and we entered into a very toxic codependent relationship. I was on a lot of psych meds and I was also abusing um, certain prescription medications, specifically sleeping medications. There were several points in the relationship where I had like a full on mental breakdown from all the, the cocktail of drugs going on in my system. And I basically expressed that I am deeply unhappy. I don't know if this relationship is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm very vulnerable. And every time that would happen, we would cry, we would hug, and we would go right back to that codependent relationship. It was a short short-lived relationship, but it was very memorable because of how often I was afraid of Andrew and deeply concerned about what he might do. He would often punch holes in the drywall of his home, and him and his friend Brandon would go into great detail about donning black trench coats like the Columbine killers, going into their old high school and shooting it up. I think they acted with an air of superiority, but at the same time, they were incredibly self-deprecating. It was a very confusing dynamic, a very confusing relationship that the two of them had. It was definitely concerning. I also came to find out um, years later that Andrew was regularly flirting and essentially cheating on me, exchanging photographs with other women, which is really funny because the reason we broke up is because I commented on my very openly gay friend's Facebook picture like, ooh, you look hot today, double winky face. And that caused Andrew, I guess, to go into a rage. So he had his best friend Brandon call me and call me a slut and threaten me, threaten to curb stop me, to hurt me. And uh, just repeating, I hope you're happy. I hope you're happy. You hope you, you can never live with yourself again. You are so filthy. And just, just berated me, just completely and utterly berated and shamed me and made me feel like a piece of shit. I cried. I was upset. I couldn't get a hold of Andrew after that. Um, so the next day, I drove to his work. Now, Shannon worked where Andrew worked. I had seen Shannon on several occasions, never spoke to her, just kind of would wave to her. I just knew of her. I drove to Andrew's work to see if I could speak to him after his shift. He did not come into work that day. I went home. I cried about it. I believe I sent him one last, like, what the fuck message. And then time went on. Everybody moved on. It was fine. Didn't reach out again. Andrew actually reached back out to me down the road, basically saying, hey, sorry for how things ended. We should be friends now. Then, of course, as all codependent relationships do. We entered into this kind of weird middle ground flirtationship that became unhealthy. So I decided to kind of end it, kind of step back away from that. Now that we've heard that summary from Emily, let's hear what Anthony and Shannon have to say about their relationship. Oh, was that? Instead of talking about what Emily says about her relationship with Anthony, first we're going to go into a sidebar about what she did not say about it. Okay, right. Makes sense. 
In her My Ex-Girlfriend Destroyed My Art video, Emily states that she has only had two bad relationships in her entire life, that being with a mutual friend named Sean, who she stated cheated on her, and the 13-year-old she dated when she was 17. Why Anthony was not mentioned as being a terrible relationship at that point, I do not know. That's right! Anthony and Shannon start off this section by pointing out that Emily did a lot of story time videos on her channel about her past traumatic relationships, and Anthony and Shannon, the scholars that they are, point out that she never mentions her relationship with Anthony. Therefore, according to that math, Anthony must have been a great boyfriend. And they come back to that point more than once during this big old long video of theirs. But my reaction to this point is, Honestly, if I was a YouTuber with a storytime channel, so like a moderately public figure, and I had been in a relationship with an abusive partner who was also a moderately public figure because of his brand and his music career and his YouTube channel, and if I had a hunch that he was working together with his girlfriend to stalk me and had been for years, I would not try to provoke them. I'm mentioning them in my videos. I have never posted a video about Shannon or Andrew. I've been way too terrified to poke the bear. I certainly would not mention them as one of the worst relationships that I'd ever had. Like, <laughs> what did you think? Anyway, Anthony and Shannon start discussing Emily and Anthony's relationship at about 5 minutes 54 seconds. Emily and Anthony dated for 3 to 4 months in 2011. Emily was 19, Anthony was 18. Let's remember. Emily said that during her relationship with Anthony, she was on a lot of psych meds and abusing a lot of prescription sleep medications. There were several points during the relationship where she had a full-on mental breakdown because of the cocktail of drugs in her system. And yet, Anthony and Shannon's first big argument in this section is that Emily could not have been using drugs at the time that she dated Anthony because Anthony has a zero tolerance policy for that in his life. Instead, they argue that Emily first started using drugs after she broke up with Anthony. Emily was not abusing drugs as she stated, and this is known because Anthony himself has a history of past drug abuse before he met Emily and has a zero tolerance policy for that in his life. Emily was well aware of this at the time and was not using drugs while dating Anthony. According to various social media accounts, Emily ran between the ages of 13 and 20. Emily didn't do drugs and was in fact very against drug use. She was not addicted to cocaine at 14 like she said, and she never abused drugs until after Anthony and her dated and broke up. They do not provide any proof that this is when Emily started using drugs, but scholars that they are, they show screenshots of some of Emily's social media between the ages of 13 and 20, wherein she disavowed drug use. This might sound familiar to some of the stuff that I talked about in my first video on this whole creep show art thing. So let me just recap some of the things that I said in that video, because those points are still valid. First of all, Shannon is assuming a lot by basing this whole argument, and honestly most of her future arguments in this video, on public facing social media. Who, at the age of 13, is 1000% honest about everything going on in their life on social media. What 13 or 14 year old is gonna casually post on Facebook about their drug use? Where all their family and friends and grandmas and aunties can, can see. I am 0% surprised that Emily may have posted online publicly disavowing drugs, but actually used drugs behind the scenes in her private life. Secondly, this is the beginning of a long and arduous process of Shannon building an argument that Emily was not high when Anthony allegedly raped her. The root of that argument is that they genuinely believe, or for the purposes of this video, have decided to present that they believe that Emily never started using any drugs until after she dated and broke up with Anthony. I'll walk you through the building of this argument as we keep moving. Third, let me just point out, this is very much Anthony's story about Emily that he's telling Shannon, Shannon is telling us. It is fully possible that Anthony is lying through his teeth about this whole section. And Shannon would have no way of knowing because she wasn't there. Just saying, let's just keep that in mind. Anyway, at about 7 minutes and 51 seconds, 
Anthony and Shannon, the class acts that they are, take a deep dive into Emily's mental health history and show off a bunch of posts that Emily made as a minor. These posts discuss various mental health diagnoses and potential possible violent tendencies or ideations. They provide screenshots of Emily documenting this behavior, in their words, as far back as middle school, because why not publicize the insecurities of a 14-year-old? to your large internet following. Jesus Christ. During this time when she was living with Anthony, Emily's behavior would cause Anthony and his grandfather to hide the knives in the home for their own safety. She would throw tantrums calling Anthony and his friends slurs, and her behavior would come across as erratic and dangerous, not just to Anthony, but to everyone present. H how again is this not supportive of the idea that she was using drugs? They don't really wrap up this section very neatly, so it's kind of hard to tell exactly what their point is, other than just embarrass Emily randomly. But I can speculate about what I think they're trying to say. I think they're implying that Emily's off-the-walls behavior during this time was due to her mental health issues, not due to drugs. Because again, their theory is that Emily never used drugs until after her relationship with Anthony ended. This is very important. Keep this in mind throughout this whole video. I think that this point about Emily having mental health issues, not drug issues, is supposed to support their later point <laughs> about Emily not being high when Anthony allegedly raped her. That is what I can glean from this section. So that's what I'm gonna go with because I don't think that this section is just an unrelated hit piece that they just happen to throw in here. Like I said, there is a method to the madness here, but it is still madness because the point they're trying to prove here is irrelevant to determining whether or not Anthony raped Emily. Rape has to do with consent. If you did not consent, you were raped. It is true that consent cannot be given when somebody is intoxicated. It is also true that sober people get raped all the time. So whether or not Emily was sober, if she did not consent to having sex with Anthony, then she was raped. It's that easy. From here, Anthony and Shannon skip ahead in time. I wasn't even gonna necessarily mention this point, but I think it's important to bring up because I think it reveals a lot about the character of Anthony. Shannon establishes that she does not remember seeing Emily at work and like waving at her in passing like Emily says in her video and she thinks that Emily might have her confused with somebody else. Okay, I don't really care about that. However, Shannon does say something that makes me pause. Shannon describes the only time during her relationship with Anthony that she saw Emily in person. There was only one time when I technically saw her in person, but it was from a distance when she had passed out in the parking lot behind the movie theater after getting into an argument with Anthony. She saw Emily from a distance passed out in the parking lot behind the movie theater after getting into an argument with Anthony. Does anybody else have red flags popping up? Anybody? Shannon clearly doesn't. I don't know about you, but I am not aware of any kind of argument that makes somebody pass out. It sounds to me like one of four things must have happened. Either one, some kind of physical altercation might have gone on between Anthony and Emily. Two, Emily might have passed out because she was under the influence of drugs. Three, Emily fainted because of some kind of mental health issue, which I think is what Shannon is implying here. Otherwise, I don't know why she would bring this up. Or four, it was one of the first two, either a physical altercation or a drug issue that made her faint, but Anthony doesn't want Shannon to know that. And since he can't pretend that that never happened because Shannon was there and she physically saw him standing there and Emily on the ground, so he told her that it was the third option, the mental health option, where Emily just happened to pass out because of their argument which sounds totally real and believable to me. Shannon does not expand on this at all. This is one of the places where I really wish that she had gone into more detail, unlike many of these other places where she went into far too much detail. Anyway, moving on. There are a couple of weird minutes in here with Anthony and Shannon just casually dropping some harassment allocations against Emily, with no evidence, by the way, king and queen of evidence over here, can't provide a thing. And then they talk about chinchillas for like a full minute. <laughs> this, this video was wild. Just to clarify, it's chinchilla tattoos. And I did not think that this was going to be important at all. But um, right at almost the end of the video, it comes back up again. So just like put a pin in that, okay? 
literally every little thing about this story is wild. Finally, at about 12 minutes and 26 seconds, Anthony and Shannon wrap up talking about Emily and Anthony's relationship. But their version of the breakup is different. Anthony broke up with Emily. The reason they broke up was because of her erratic behavior and nothing else. Emily also lied when she said how the breakup occurred, saying that Anthony's friend, who she calls Brandon, whose real name is Bryce, told her that she was a worthless whore who he was going to curb, stomp, and kill. This never happened. Instead, Anthony broke up with Emily himself twice. However, Emily wouldn't listen to him and kept coming to his home, kept showing up at his friend Bryce's house, and would try to go places Anthony was going to be, including once to his work where she had to be escorted out. Only because she wouldn't take no for an answer and wouldn't listen to Anthony did Anthony ask Bryce to tell her to leave Anthony alone and confirm that he wanted the relationship to end. Bryce at no point threatened her. When Bryce tells this story in his own video on his own channel, because he put out a video about this even though he's very very barely involved. He describes the conversation as pretty straightforward and normal and not as violent and scary as Emily remembers. There's not much I can say here to prove or disprove anything because I wasn't there, but obviously both parties involved remember this conversation wildly differently. I don't know whose version of events to believe or not believe, but in a way it almost doesn't really matter. All we really need to know is that Emily interpreted it as being scary and threatening and that it stayed in her memory and informed her choices later on. At the end of the day, Emily and Anthony were officially broken up now. At 13 minutes and seven seconds, Shannon does her cut in white knight section about Bryce and the fact that he's autistic. I talked at length in a past video about how Shannon talks about Bryce here and the manipulation that I see in that. So I won't go into it again here, but here's what I'll say about this. Emily never mentioned in her video that Bryce is autistic. Maybe she has or had at the time a genuine misunderstanding of autism, what it is, how it works, how it can present itself sometimes. Maybe she didn't know that Bryce is autistic or didn't know whether or not or how it would relate to the experience that she had with Bryce. But also, maybe she isn't bringing up Bryce's autism as an excuse because it might not be as related to this whole thing as Shannon seems to think that it is. There is a difference between somebody having a special interest in something and admiring the Dark Knight and characters like the Joker and building your own halo armor to wear around because you enjoy it. There's a difference between enjoying your special interest and talking with your friend at length about going back to your old high school and shooting it up, which is what Emily claims she heard them talk about multiple times. Those two things are not the same. Not the same topic, not the same conversation. Emily knows the difference between those things, and so does Shannon. And most importantly, Emily was there at the time, and Shannon was not. You know what's weird? With this situation about talking about going to the high school to shoot it up, and with the phone call, with the curb stomp and kill comments, Emily has such a different memory of what Bryce said than everybody else's memory of what he said. How odd. Gaslighting. Is Emily really having that difficult of a time understanding Bryce? Making someone question their own reality. She's just like hallucinating what he said? A person who presents a false narrative or to another group or person. Is it possible? Which leads them to doubt their perceptions that people are lying to protect Bryce. And become misled, disoriented, or distressed. Because because they know that he said some shit that he shouldn't have said. I don't know. I don't know. Gaslight. Finally, to cap part one, Shannon and Anthony bring up Anthony's step-grandmother in order to disprove a point in Emily's second video on this topic, which is titled Creepshow Art Did Not Work Alone. In that video, Emily talks about how she wanted to send Anthony a restraining order and how she messaged his step-grandmother to get some information from her in order to be able to do so. Here is the message I sent to Anthony's step-grandmother in November of 2017. At 2640, Emily Claire because his step-grandma and I weren't friends on Facebook, I believe she never saw this message. Anthony and Shannon tried to disprove that this happened, that this message was sent. Emily also stated that she sent Anthony's step-grandmother a Facebook message, allegedly saying that she believed Anthony was harassing her at one point. We reached out to confirm this, and Anthony's step-grandmother says no such message was ever received. Which is literally what Emily said in her video. So... This was an entirely moot point. Thank you so much for wasting my time. Let's move on. Part 2. 2012 
heroin. As I mentioned in my prior video, Anthony and Shannon spend a lot of time setting up this argument that Emily accuses all of her exes of being abusive. And remember, we have to keep in mind that Anthony and Shannon have a theory that Emily never used drugs until after her relationship with Anthony, and any erratic behavior up to then was due to mental health struggles. So in this section, Anthony and Shannon take us through the timelines of several of Emily's past relationships, providing so-called evidence of Emily falsely accusing her exes or sometimes their current partners of abuse. Since I already talked about this section for a while in my previous video on this, I won't spend too much time here, but let me just mention, <laughs> if we've learned anything from the likes of Tana Mojo and Gabby Hanna is that story time videos as a genre are often exaggerated or embellished for entertainment value. For example, Emily even said that in one of the story time videos that Anthony and Shannon brought up, in which Emily said that she was a 17 year old in a relationship with a 13 year old, she says in the tweet that this story was true in a way, but she had reversed the roles, putting herself in the shoes of the 17 year old, even though in reality, she was the 13 year old in that relationship. So personally, I can go either Either way on the validity of her story time videos. I have no problem with them being fully real or fully embellished for entertainment value. I can find good reasons why Emily would choose to take either route with them, and I don't think that either option makes Emily a bad person. What is definitely true is that Anthony and Shannon were not there at the time and we're not part of these relationships. They're trying to glean a pattern of behavior from scattered social media posts, when honestly, they will never be able to know the truth of these relationships. Also, I've gotta say, Anthony and Shannon really want you to take them at their word a lot during this video. And honestly, we have no reason to do that. They should have spent this first half hour of their video giving us reasons to trust them, rather than dive right into a rabbit hole that is only slightly tangentially related to Emily's allegations. Thanks to the lol cow situation, we all think that Shannon is a two-faced liar. We have no reason to take her and Anthony at their word over Emily. So anyway, at 25 minutes and 42 seconds, Shannon makes the point that I elaborated on in my prior video about this. All of her posts from 2012 to before her video on my husband and I state that she became sober from heroin in 2012. However, in her video against my husband and myself, Emily states that she only really got sober in 2015. I personally believe she's changing the date in order to accuse my husband of an assault that could not have happened for multiple reasons, not least of which is the fact that we can prove she wasn't using heroin when they were in contact. She then provides a time of what she believes to be Emily's heroin usage from May to October of 2012, according to Emily's social media. Reminder, social media usually is not 100% accurate when it comes to talking about drug use. Now that we are 28 and a half minutes into this two and a half hour film, let's just recap so that we're all on the same page about what's happened so far in Anthony and Shannon's video. In summary, and in my opinion, Anthony and Shannon theorize that Emily only used drugs from May 2012 to October 2012, based solely on her social media posts, which is flimsy evidence at best. They dig up social media posts that Emily made as a teenager about her mental health in order to imply that when she was living with Anthony and had such erratic behavior, it was due to her mental health issues, not a drug issue. Since they believe that Emily was not a heroin user at the time that she alleges that Anthony raped her, even though Emily herself says that she was using that night and was visibly intoxicated and was nodding off, Emily must be lying about being raped by Anthony. They do not even talk about whether or not Emily gave consent. They do nothing to prove or disprove if Anthony even went to her house in the first place. They just focus on disproving that Emily was high as if sober people can't get raped. For anyone who is still not clear about this, <clears throat> Anthony and Shannon literally just spent <laughs> the first 28 minutes of this video proving a point that is literally irrelevant. It does not matter if she was high or if she was sober. It only matters if she consented. And as far as anybody can tell, she didn't. 
Therefore, it was rape. Case closed. Moving on. Goddamn. Let's all take a little breather. We're only at part two and there are 18 in total. Breathe out the toxicity. Breathe in some good vibes. We are all watchers of this situation, but we are not in it, so we can feel peace. Okay, let's move on. Part 3, 4, and 5, Online Harassment, Emily Sugarfruit, and Camming. Hi, I took so much of a breather that it's the next day now. Here in part three, Anthony and Shannon are responding to Emily saying that she started getting more online harassment once she started working professionally with Anthony and his band. They also respond to Emily's retelling of the process of making Anthony's song, Stardust, and give their own version of events. First, let's start with Emily's claims that Anthony and Shannon were the ones behind Emily experiencing an increase in online harassment. Here's what she has to say about it. What was interesting is when I started working professionally with him is when I started noticing some like really negative comments across all my social media. I didn't think much of it because that's just kind of, you know, the business on social media is you get negative comments. I figured it was normal. I was just seeing an increased volume in them. Now, here is how Shannon retells this statement from Emily. One thing that Emily states in her video is that online harassment was never leveled at her until after she started working with Anthony professionally. So... This is literally not what Emily said. There is a big fucking difference between I figured I was just seeing an increase in negative comments and this is the first time online harassment has ever been leveled at me. So we can really see that Anthony and Shannon twist Emily's words here and then they go through a whole long process of trying to disprove something that Emily didn't even say. It's an obvious deflection from what Emily is actually talking about and honestly, a waste of everybody's time. Now, as for the story of the recording of the song, Stardust. Anthony was the lead singer and he had a female background singer, kind of, but it was also kind of a duet. They sang back and forth at certain parts. Emily said in her original video that she thought Shannon was the female singer on that track. And Shannon got pissed because Emily suggested to Anthony that allegedly Shannon's vocals were weak and Emily could sing them better, so Anthony put Emily on the song. Emily addresses this further in her second video about this situation, which by the way was published three months before this video by Anthony and Shannon, so they had plenty of time to watch it and cross-reference it and make sure that stuff was consistent and they just didn't. In that video, Emily clarifies, I wasn't clear about this in my first video. Anthony actually came to me with the song Stardust and wanted to know what I thought about the song in general. And he let me know that the vocals were probably just going to end up being placeholder vocals and he was looking for a singer to possibly replace them. So I was giving him the opinion that he asked for. I was just a little bitchy when I gave him my opinion. I was like, dude, yeah, don't keep these vocals. They're weak. Mine are better. Like to explain that a little bit better, that's kind of how the conversation went down. So it's not like I was just giving out my unsolicited opinion. So this was on March 25th, 2014. Anthony says, hey, so it turns out you were pretty right. Your voice would fit way better. Would you still be interested in singing? Please let me know. Also, my phone's off to the first. So if you want to, just get a hold of me here. I said, yes, I can meet Thursday at four if you're available and possibly Sunday as well. He said, mm, yeah, four on Thursday works great. I said, see you then. Can I have the address? I'm pretty sure I remember, but just in case. And he gives me the address. And then later I checked in to see if we were still good. And I said, see you tomorrow. Just as a quick note, it says that Emily is talking with Facebook user, but that is Anthony. The Facebook account that he was using at that time has since been deleted. His name appearing as just Facebook user is consistent with both of Emily's videos as well as this big video from Anthony and Shannon. So there's no dispute among the three of them. This is Anthony. 
I think that um, Anthony has lied to Shannon about this. The version of the story that Anthony and Shannon tell in this return video, again, without any screenshots, their version of the story goes like this. When Stardust came out, I was not in contact with Anthony because I was actively dating another person. I have also never been asked to sing on any of his music because I do not sing. The person who was on the original version of Stardust that she heard was not me. It was a person named Lonaya. Anthony had taken music courses in college with her and asked her to be on the song because he liked her voice. She was also not taken off of the song because Emily stated she couldn't sing or because she faced harassment. Rather, Lanaya's boyfriend wasn't comfortable with her being on the song with another man, so Anthony respectfully took her out. Anthony then asked Emily to be on the song. She was simply the second choice. According to Emily's screenshots, this is not true. Importantly, Anthony is the one who brought up the idea of getting a new singer to replace the one that was currently on his track. Emily basically just agreed with him and then offered her services to be that person. At no point does Anthony mention a female singer who dropped out because of her overprotective mans or anything even resembling the story that Anthony and Shannon are now telling. And most importantly of all, Emily has screenshots and Anthony and Shannon have none. What am I supposed to believe? Like with all the other screenshots, they were able to pull up fucking queen of screenshots over here. Can't pull up any <laughs> screenshots about this situation? Very interesting. This whole moment is also proof of the fact that Anthony and Emily had some kind of professional relationship going on here. Even before Emily volunteered to step in as a singer on this song, they would bounce ideas off of each other artistically, even when they were not dating. All of these little points are clarified in screenshot and showed in Emily's second video on this, which is a follow-up to the first. Like, did they think we weren't going to see that video from Emily? Even though they linked it in their description of this big long video as one of the resources that they pulled from? <laughs> and speaking of which, did they really think that they tricked everyone who looked at their description box into thinking that Emily deleted all of those videos they used as resources? <laughs> That's right, friends. Anthony and Shannon thought that they could fool all their viewers and cover up their contradictory evidence. When I was analyzing this video from Anthony and Shannon, I went to their description box and clicked on some of the videos that they provided and all of the links that I clicked on for some reason or another went to this, this video is no longer available page. How odd. However, when I looked up the videos individually by title or just like, for example, with this video from Emily, just went to Emily's page, scrolled down until I saw the video, it was still there. I could still find it and access it. So I thought this was a little sus. And at first I thought that maybe it was just like some weird tech glitch that was just over my head. But then I went on Twitter and I saw this tweet, which made it all make sense. This is interesting. In the description of Creepshow's video on Emily, video links have been cut to make it look like Emily deleted videos. Video links have three blue dots to show there's more there. Dots at the end of Creepshow's links are white. Here in their black background nighttime version, on my white background daytime version, the dots are black. Meaning she purposefully typed them there. Huh, how about that? Shannon and Anthony, Shanthony, dare I say. Wanna explain that? for us, wanna just clear that up maybe? I am so ready to hear this explanation. So whatever, go ahead, huh? Do you the explanation for why, why you made the links look like they're not available anymore? I'm waiting. After Anthony and Shannon try to tell the story, the real story of Anthony's song, they come back around to trying to disprove this point that Emily never made, that this was the first time that Emily got online harassment by bringing up these old posts that Emily had made, venting about online harassment. But if anything, in my opinion, this just goes to support Emily's point. Like it supports the point that Emily actually made not the point that Shannon thinks she made. Like, listen, Shannon, will ya? Listening ears, remember? Now we get to part four, Emily Sugarfruit, which is another long section. It's about 26 minutes, but guess what? It's pointless again. <laughs> In this section, it seems like Anthony and Shannon are just going to great lengths to try to support this point that yes, Emily had experienced online harassment before she started working with Anthony, but um, Emily never said 
that the very first online harassment she experienced was after she started working with Anthony. She said that it increased, not that it was the very first. <laughs> so they go off on this whole side journey, going through this whole period of Emily's life when she went by the online name of Emily Sugarfruit and did anime reviews online to prove that it was this era, this earlier era when Emily first started to receive online harassment, okay? And like, oh yeah? Wow! What sleuths you are! In this Emily Sugarfruit section, part four, they also claim that Emily said that she was forced into doing cam work by an abusive ex-boyfriend. And again, Emily never said that. I was still in a, a very, very toxic, not romantic relationship, but a business relationship with someone where I had no bodily autonomy. Not romantic relationship, but a business relationship. Business relationship. So Shannon's just wasting her time and our time talking about these things. I'm actually gonna give you guys an out here because to be honest, this can get exhausting after a while. If you don't wanna sit here and listen to me disprove these pointless and unrelated points, you are welcome to skip ahead to the next timestamp. The most substantial part of this section is the discussion around how Emily got fired from her job in 2013, which Anthony and Shannon consider to be included within online harassment. So if you wanna find out about that one specifically, I can put a timestamp for it here on the screen, or at least please check the description. I'll have a timestamp specifically to that section. If you want to stick around and watch me debunk and shred up their points, you are also welcome to do that, of course. We're going to start with the second point about camming first, because that one's kind of quick and easy to debunk. Emily never said that she was forced into camming work by an abusive boyfriend. She specifically said it was a business relationship, not a romantic relationship, in which she had no bodily autonomy. And when I made my little update video ranting about this one little point, Emily actually found it. She commented on it. Hi, Emily. Thank you. I hope I'm doing you justice in this big, long video if you're watching. And here's what Emily commented on my video. And she gave a little explanation about why she was doing the camming. And would you fucking look at that? It wasn't an abusive ex-boyfriend. <laughs> Stop putting words in Emily's mouth. You do not end up looking right in this situation if you build your righteousness on lies. You just put yourself up on a higher pedestal so that when you're knocked down, you have a farther fall. Now, Anthony and Shannon start part four by summarizing the points they're about to make and then dive into disproving that Emily did in fact experience online harassment before working with Anthony on his music, which again, Emily also said. So we're just all in agreement here. We're just gonna expand and expound upon how much we all agree. Great. To combat this claim that Emily never made, Anthony and Shannon bring up some controversial things that Emily did on her Emily Sugarfruit YouTube channel. On the Sugarfruit channel, Emily ended up doing a couple of controversial things, like posting an anime review naked in a bathtub. Emily states now in 2021 that she was high on heroin when she did this, but as established, that cannot be true. Anthony and Shannon are the experts of who's using drugs when, and they believe that she only used drugs from May to October of 2012, and they don't believe in relapse, so that can't be true, can it? The video of her in a bathtub caused a lot of anger in the community because the YouTube anime community is filled with mostly men who saw Emily doing that as a cheap way to get subscribers and attention. To really bring home their point that this controversial video of Emily caused her to receive some harassment, they literally play 10 minutes of clips from YouTube videos that were made at the time in like 2013 or 2014 on the subject of this video that Emily posted. 10 minutes of clips. <laughs> They also bring up a YouTube video of Emily dancing in her bra, which somebody out there spammed to all of Emily's Facebook friends, which included Anthony at the time, and caused a little bit of scandal in their circle. So yes, indeed, as we were already in agreement on, Emily had indeed experienced harassment before working with Anthony. She did not say that she never had. So what's the fucking point of this whole fucking section? I hate this. Also though, let me just say, um, Shannon said that at the time that this harassment took place, specifically over the video of her dancing in a bra, Anthony defended Emily against it. She was not in the music video for Autumn's Moment because of the online harassment she was already receiving for posting content under the name Emily Sugarfruit. Harassment that Anthony actively defended her against. So, um, where's the screenshots of that, huh? Queen of screenshots? Queen of evidence? Wanna provide me with some screenshots? Hmm? 
because all you showed us was a DM conversation of you and Anthony talking about this video that got posted and Anthony was just complaining like a whiny little bitch boy about how this issue around Emily was going to delay his filming of his music video. Anthony was one of those friends who the message was spammed to and he had this reaction in our private Facebook messages. Fuck, see that video of Emily yet? What video? Kevin hasn't sent me anything in a while. I think I just saw it, but I'm not sure what I saw. Yeah, I'm gonna sock the guy who put it up in the face. Apparently everyone's seen it, so we can't really have her on the video. It'll be about that. Wait, a guy put it up? Is it a different video? Because I watched the one on her channel. But you already have footage. What are you going to do? Oh, there's one of her dancing for like 10 seconds in a bra. People are just doing the internet bully thing. We didn't see the one on her channel. What do you mean? We are shooting with a new person tomorrow. We already had stuff with Emmy, and now we have to throw it away. This little fucker's spam video is fucking with our goddamn production, and I'm fucking pissed. We were supposed to do a shoot with Emmy tomorrow, but now she's kind of disappeared. Luckily, we found someone new, but I like the shit to run smooth and not waste my fucking gas and our fucking time. I don't really care if these upper middle class Bay Area fucks want to feel entitled and knock their shit around in their craft, but it's really irritating when it comes to wasting my time and money that I do not fucking have. Holy shit, that's really messed up. I mean, the other channel, the second one she has, Emily Sugarfruit. Wow, that's really messed up. Is she okay? I mean, at least you have a replacement for her, but it's still messed up. But I think she posted one under her channel too. Fucking hell, that person has too much time on their hands to be fucking with someone like that. That does not sound to me like him defending her. Anyway, after all of that, Anthony and Shannon respond to Emily's story of how she got fired in 2013 because her company was emailed a compromising video of her. Andrew and potentially Shannon found out about this regular job and decided to email my job and send them a compromising video of myself. They, they posed as a client, said, I'm a regular client. You've lost my business because look at your, you know, disgusting human being of a receptionist. This job was her only way out of an abusive relationship. And now that she didn't have it anymore, she was going to be homeless. They got me fired from my fucking job. And I actually ended up homeless for a period of time. In response, of course, Anthony and Shannon say that this is a lie that can be disproven by Emily's social media. Because in Shanthony world, Every detail of everything that ever happened to everyone is thoroughly documented on public-facing social media. While she makes no mention as to what happened, we can assume that her job found out about YouTube and let her go. Emily stated in her video against me that someone posed as a client and sent an inappropriate video of her camming to her boss, but because she didn't start camming until 2014, a year after, we know that can't be true. Basically, there are three points that Anthony and Shannon dispute about Emily's story about this firing. One, Emily blaming them for it. Two, Emily being forced into cam work by an abusive ex-boyfriend as a result of being fired. And three, Emily becoming homeless as a result of being fired. Let's start with point number one, how Emily got fired. First of all, neither side of this situation has shown documents or screenshots specifically related to how this firing went down. Anthony and Shannon certainly don't have any in this video. And Emily has said that she would try to get more receipts about this. I am going to try and get in touch with this job to confirm that they did fire me because they received this email. That will be a very important receipt, so I'm really going to try hard to get that. But so far she has not provided any, at least not that I have found on YouTube or Twitter. The only clue that we have about this is that Britta Filter alluded to and possibly took credit for sending something to Emily's company, so let's just keep that shit in mind. I also just want to point out a few misquotes in Anthony and Shannon's retelling of this whole situation because they are important to what's going on here. Anthony and Shannon say that Emily was fired because someone sent a video of Emily camming. That is not what the fuck she said. Emily said that her company was sent a compromising video of her. Anthony and Shannon are the ones who said that that was a video of her camming. They try to say that Emily said this. They even put the word camming in quotes on screen to imply that they were directly quoting Emily talking about this. Emily stated in her video against me that someone posed as a client and sent an inappropriate video of her camming to her boss, but because she didn't start camming until 2014, a year after, we know that can't be true. But Emily literally did not say that it was a camming video. And send them a compromising video of myself. In my opinion, the bathtub video or the dancing in a bra video, probably one of those is the compromising video that was sent because it was public facing and both of those are compromising enough 
for someone who would fire an employee over something like that. Anthony and Shannon are just like assuming a lot and it just makes me very suspicious of them. Like how do they know it was a camming video if they were not involved in the sending of the video? It makes me think that you know some things that you're claiming not to know. Next, let's talk about their claim that Emily said she was being forced into camming by an abusive ex-boyfriend. As I said before, Literally, that's not what she said. Not romantic relationship, but a business relationship. When Anthony and Shannon bring up Bob and do all this work to try to disprove that he was making her do camming, it's a literally pointless point because Emily never said that he was. Like you would save yourselves and us so much time in this video if you just listen to Emily, Jesus Christ. Anyway, the third point that Anthony and Shannon want to dispute is about Emily being made homeless because of being fired. Emily said in her slanderous video that this firing led to her being homeless after leaving her abusive boyfriend who was forcing her to do cam work, which again, could not have happened. She was fired on September 16th, 2013, according to our Instagram. Then nine days later on September 25th, 2013, she posts her last photo at her father's home. So losing her job didn't impact her home life at all. The next picture she posts is this one on October 4th, of some pillows on a bed with a white wall in the background. This shows that she moved from her father's home into her boyfriend Bob's home. Honestly, as far as I'm concerned, this is yet another like pointless point. First of all, assuming that you were the ones who got her fired, right? Like technically, even if getting her fired didn't immediately send her to like living on the streets, it still cut off her source of income. And the natural result of that is inability to pay rent. As for the homelessness in and of itself, I think that homelessness can mean different things to different people. For example, as Emily pointed out in her first video, Shannon and Anthony referred to themselves as being homeless when they were willingly choosing to live in their car. A lot of people wouldn't consider that like traditional homelessness because they were still making plenty of money. They were just using it to pay off debt, which is fine, like do what you want with your money, but also acknowledge that that's not like traditional homelessness. Similarly, Emily might consider it homelessness to not be able to afford her own place to live. Like, yes, she was able to crash with her dad until she moved in with her boyfriend, but she was crashing there because she didn't have a home to go to, AKA she was homeless. In my opinion, even though their situations are different, I feel like Emily's like level of homelessness was about the same as Shannon and Anthony's. So I don't really think that they have a right to get so butthurt about this section. Anyway, whoever got her fired either put her on the path to homelessness or actually made her homeless. Both are bad. Moving on, part five, camming. It, it basically, it's an expansion pack on part four. Just like part four, it is built on a false premise that Emily had said that her ex-boyfriend who was abusive to her was the one that forced her to cam. And we've already talked about how that's not what Emily said. And I've shown you the screenshot where she talks about the actual situation there. So I don't feel like I need to talk about this. Let's, let's just move the fuck on. Part six. Part six, disproving her own story. Finally, literally an hour in to Shannon and Anthony's video, they finally have some points to make and not points that are completely irrelevant or based on their own shit that they made up and words that they put into Emily's mouth. But they actually have a couple of good points to make here and one really bad point, but you can't have the yang without the yin, I guess. They point out some individual circumstances from Emily's video that she may have misconstrued as being caused by Anthony and Shannon, but possibly were not. These circumstances have to do with Emily's hacked Facebook account, as well as the photo bucket account that held Emily's lewds and nudes, which some of them were taken of her as a minor, and which she says were also obtained from the private messages in that Facebook account. So that seems to imply that the same person who hacked the Facebook account also made the photo bucket account. This is actually a very interesting section to talk about, so I'm gonna get to that. I'm very excited about it. And then after that, we're gonna go back to one of Anthony and Shannon's classics. Emily has this claim that Anthony and Shannon left a bad review that lost her big old client, and and in response to that, they do their like classic putting words into Emily's mouth so that then they can disprove them, which is like, it's fine and all, but like they really need to mix it up with these arguments. You know, the sound is just so predictable and overdone. They really need to freshen it up. Like the vibe is so 
boring at this point, you know? Give me something new to listen to, please. Like, so the first thing that Anthony and Shannon address in this section is Emily's story about a friend of hers getting her Facebook account impersonated and that account being used, in Emily's opinion, to fish for information about Emily. Andrew and potentially maybe Shannon uh, did everything they could to try to find out where I was working. For some reason, they knew it was at a restaurant, a specific type of restaurant. So they literally copied exactly one of my friend's Facebook accounts, took the, the about information, all of their pictures, and made this other Facebook account and acted like, oop, my Facebook got deleted, Emily. Like, can you add me again? And my dumbass was like, okay. I accepted the friend request and then of course, they post, hey, does anybody know of any really cool, this specific type of cuisine restaurants in this specific location? And at that point, I'm like, you are not my friend. And so I blocked them. I knew right away that they were trying to find out where I work so that they could call and get me fired from another job. Block them. Let my other friend know, hey, you're being impersonated. Anthony and Shannon say that these allegations are all false because Anthony was Emily's Facebook friend at that time. In November of 2012, she and Anthony became Facebook friends themselves, meaning that he wouldn't have needed to make a fake account to get information on her the way she says. She debunks this claim herself without realizing this on Twitter by showing their Facebook messages from this time, where she directly tells him where she is working. To be honest with you, these are kind of valid points. So yeah, Anthony and Shannon get a point here, in my opinion. Good job. Kinda. They don't discuss the fact that Shannon and Anthony could have impersonated her friend for other reasons, saying that they were already friends with Emily. Maybe it disproves Emily's theory of why they would want to impersonate her friend, but it doesn't disprove that they actually did so. So, they like a half a point on that one. But with that being said, I just want to pause for a second to acknowledge that it is a lot harder to prove a negative than to prove a positive. Like if we're proving that you did something, we can usually find a screenshot of you saying XYZ or like security camera footage of you being in a certain place at a certain time doing a certain thing. However, proving you did not do something is a lot harder, especially with online stuff. Like I can't think of what kind of screenshot would prove that somebody did did not hack somebody or did not impersonate their Facebook page, you know? Maybe like internet records or search history or something. Honest to God, let me know in the comments below because I genuinely, I don't know enough about the internet and technology, so I might be missing something here. But I do think that by the nature of this allegation, Shannon and Anthony are fighting an uphill battle to prove their innocence to their credit. Whether or not Anthony and Shannon were the ones who did this, I do think that Emily experienced it in some way. It's like a really specific experience to just fabricate. But she did contact her friend who got impersonated to warn them that the impersonator was out there. So that means that two accounts existed, one fake and one real. Whether or not Shannon and Anthony were behind it, remains to be seen. A little later on in this section, Anthony and Shannon come back to these Facebook hacking claims, so I'm just gonna go over it now. When Emily talks about this situation, she said that the people who hacked in and locked her out of her Facebook account emailed her from the same email address that was now the login for the Facebook account. That's how she learned that email account was why do I have to do this 22 at gmail.com or why do I have to do this 44 at gmail.com? She said it was some kind of double number, but she didn't remember for sure. So Anthony and Shannon connected at least one of those two email addresses to a YouTube account that was uploading gaming videos at the time that this all happened. I understand how it may have looked in hindsight to Emily like Anthony and Shannon were behind all of this because with so many other actions going on at the same time that seemed likely to be Shannon and Anthony, it makes sense that Emily, as a admittedly paranoid kind of victim, would connect these instances of harassment to them as well. However, considering everything else that was going on in this time period, with the bathtub video and the backlash that caused in the anime community, and considering that there is a pretty large overlap between the anime community and the gaming community, I can see Shannon's point here that it very well could have been this gamer harassing Emily by phishing her Facebook account rather than Anthony and Shannon. Or honestly, it could be a whole other person with the email address like, why do I have to do this 88 or 33? Emily just said it was some double number so technically there's 
like 10 options. <laughs> One more addition to this whole large point. About a half hour later in Emily's video, a little over one hour in, Emily mentions that when her Facebook account was hacked, Facebook emailed her to tell her the location that it was being logged into from. What's interesting is back when my Facebook account was hacked, I wasn't aware that Andrew was doing any of this, right? Um, but Facebook had sent me um, an, an email basically saying, um, here is where the unknown login came from. The IP address pointed to the city where Andrew was from and where he resided in at the time. This one fact does not definitely mean that it was Anthony hacking in and logging into her account, but it's just something to note. What's interesting to me is that Emily goes on to say that she thought for a while that there were two different stalkers stalking her. Based on the evidence that we're talking about right now with this Facebook situation, I'm inclined to think that it is possible that that was the case. It's just interesting because now in this video we have reasonable evidence that is pointing in a few reasonable directions. We have reason to think that this part of the story could have been done by Anthony and Shannon or by why do I have to do this 22 at gmail.com. Maybe even both of them, who knows. Anthony and Shannon also talk about the photo bucket account in this section, and this is one of my favorite sections because it's just so dumb and I love it. <laughs> Emily said that whoever hacked her Facebook account also had a photo bucket account where they stashed her nudes and lewds, some of which were taken when she was a minor, um, that were able to be found in Emily's private messages on Facebook, implying that the same person who hacked her Facebook page also got those photos from her Facebook messages and made this photo bucket account with them. What's interesting here, and gives me a little chuckle, in the last example with Facebook and with somebody impersonating Emily's friend, Shannon and Anthony bring up what I would call like shared evidence. The fact that Emily was Facebook friends with Anthony was a shared experience and both Emily and Anthony and Shannon can go back in their Facebook profiles, go back in their history, go back in their messages, go back in their memories, and both sides of this can look back and see, oh right, that did happen at that time. Oops, I remember. Okay, you're right. However, with this photo bucket issue, Anthony and Shannon try to go a more research-based route and it really backfires on them, and <laughs> it's great to see. Emily says her Facebook was hacked, and nudes from when she was a minor were taken off of it and placed onto Photo Bucket publicly. Photo Bucket doesn't allow nude slash lewd photos on their site, so the likelihood of this happening is slim. Photo Bucket's policies are actively very anti-nudity. Um, so <laughs> this is a flawed argument in my opinion. First of all, they show screenshots of discussion forums from 2006 to 2009 where users are just talking about, oh, photo bucket doesn't allow nudes. The time period we're discussing in this whole video is 2013 to 2018. So it's highly plausible that the TOS for photo bucket might have changed between 2006 to 2009 era and the 2013 to 2018 era. Like who knows, maybe they did allow news for a time. But secondly, most importantly, regardless of the official terms of service, it seems that people have always found a way to host their news and lewds on photo bucket. For example, upon a quick Google search, I found an NBC News article from 2012 called Photo Bucket Security Hole May Leave Your Nudes Exposed by Katie Notopoulos. I'll link this article in the description of this video. This 2012 article reveals that a hole in Photo Bucket's privacy has made it so that private albums can be accessed with little work using a Fusker program. The article even opens with this really like hashtag relatable <laughs> opening where the author says, remember Photo Bucket? Yes? You still have an account on there? You don't happen to have any old nudes on there, do you? To me, the very existence of this article on a major news website like NBC suggests that storing nudes on photo bucket was a common enough practice that this flaw in their security was newsworthy. So like, yeah, people were using their private and password protected albums on photo bucket to store nudes and lewds. Sorry if you didn't know how to do that, Shannon, but other people did. Now that we've established this, Emily's stalker probably wasn't lying about where they stored her nudes, because why would they? But even if they were, this is still a dumb point to fixate on. Arguing over the online location of Emily's stolen nudes does nothing <laughs> to disprove that Anthony and Shannon were the people who stole them. Whether they were stored on Photo Bucket, Dropbox, iCloud, Google Drive, 
wherever somebody had Emily's nudes and was taunting her and blackmailing her with them that's the point <laughs> similar to the Facebook thing this may or may not have been Anthony and Shannon but I have no reason to doubt that Emily experienced this in some way and it was being done to her by someone next up Emily and Shannon raise doubts and questions about Emily's claim that when she did makeup as a side gig, Anthony and Shannon lost her a big client because they left a negative review saying that all her brushes were dirty and she was unhygienic. So I want to point out that in this text box, she puts the words negative review in quotes, which makes me want to ask Emily a couple of questions. <laughs> like, can you give me some more information about that? Are they like in air quotes, like it's sarcastic or... Is this a quote from the review? That's not usual, so what does that mean? Anyway, in response to this, Shannon goes on to say, Emily states on screen that she was also working as a quote, professional makeup artist at this time, and that Anthony and I lost her a huge client because we allegedly wrote a negative review saying all her brushes were dirty and she was unhygienic. She later disproves this herself via Twitter. She contradicts her original statement by showing the screenshots of her conversation with Anthony, saying she's about to start work as a makeup artist after she gets her certification. But then in the tweet itself, states that she never actually got her license and simply advertised herself on social media and got clients via Craigslist. Meaning that there would be no way to leave a negative review for her services seeing as she only got clients via Craigslist and social media where reviews cannot be left. So that's why I have questions. Either Shannon is flat out lying and they did leave a review somewhere that did cause Emily to lose a big client and she's just like excluding that information or there's more to the story here and we just need some more clarification. I'm kind of leaning toward this one because the fact that negative review was in quotes kind of makes me think that that was Emily's way of like quickly summing up a situation but that maybe it was more complicated than that like maybe Shannon and Anthony were like shit talking her makeup artistry skills or something and so she was like we'll just call it that they left me a negative review you know I don't know I just I want to hear more about it I don't really have enough information here to fully believe Emily or Anthony and Shannon on this particular issue finally Shannon again puts words in Emily's mouth so that she can disprove them how fun listen to what she says here Emily then stated in her video that after she lost her makeup job she would never post where she was or her schedule or anything about her life on a public platform because it would be used to harass her now I cannot for the life of me find Emily saying this in her video. All I can find is the sentence that Shannon puts on screen while she's saying this, where Emily says that after losing the big client, at that point she felt like there was nowhere she could hide from Anthony and Shannon, for context. So she stopped doing makeup and found a job out of town and she largely stopped posting online. That's all she said. I also think that due to the context of the moment, Emily means that she largely stopped posting online about her makeup, which looks to be pretty true, thanks to the social media receipts that Shannon has provided. I also found the social media she is talking about that she used to showcase her makeup on, and it's the retroface.tumblr.com. She only posted to this blog five times for about a month between September September and October 2014. She was always the person featured and never showed any client work besides her doing a sugar skull on her boyfriend for Halloween. She did have a makeup YouTube channel that was never uploaded to that was made January 2014 under the name Emily Emmy Way. Thank you so much again, Shannon, how thoughtful. All this extra shit that Shannon says about Emily never posting her location again because she didn't want it to be used by her stalker. Emily never said that. <laughs> she just didn't say that shit. But of course, as she is wont to do, Shannon and Anthony spend the rest of this section disproving this thing that Emily never said. <laughs> <laughs> that overdone, overplayed, golden oldie, we have to listen to it again. It is literally pointless to talk about that section, so I'm, I'm gonna skip it. Let's keep moving to the next point. <laughs> I'm gonna mention really quick, they've been following along Emily's video, like I said before, and like kind of going reaction style. Emily brings up a topic in her video and then they kind of parallel respond to it in their video. However, right here, Anthony and Shannon just skip over responding to several important sections in Emily's video. I've already gone through the big old list, but just to retouch on it really quickly, at this section they skip over 
Emily's saying she started getting a lot more comments on YouTube comparing her channel to Creepshow Art and saying that Creepshow Art was copying her. The section where Anthony like high key bullies Emily for her video not going viral enough for him to call it viral and saying that she bought views and subscribers and then this account called Aja or at not viral Emily messaging her and saying the same thing within minutes. Quite notably, they skip over a particularly damning receipt. Now, I do not have what I said to him, but I essentially said something like, why are you harassing me? Why are you doing this to me? We loved each other once. Can we not respect that? Can we just respect each other and go our separate ways? I just want to be left alone, essentially. He says back, harassing? No, I've only posted in what my accounts are. Like, what has my face on it? And I'm not angry. I was just curious. I figured maybe if I get more ridiculous, I'd get a response. I wanted to see where your stuff went, which is why I was bummed you blocked me. But no, I'm not angry at all. Thank you for the reason, though. Much appreciated. Good luck out there. He brings up this idea of sock accounts, but she didn't say anything about sock accounts there. <laughs> it's just weird that if he wasn't running sock accounts, he would even think to say, I've only been posting on accounts that have my face on them. If you're not using sock accounts, you don't think of bringing that up. You know what I mean? Like, it just seems real sus. And finally, number four, real big one here, they completely skip over Emily talking about the rape allegations. They do talk a lot about it at the beginning of their video, so like, I'll let that slide, but still, just saying. These are just some of the many points that Shannon and Anthony just do not address for God knows why. One would think that if they were not behind the Brita Filter account, that they would have addressed all of these individual points. And they would have said, like, see, you said yourself that this kid with the Brita Filter account is the one who did this, but they didn't. Because that would leave them needing to acknowledge the fact that Emily said that this Brita Filter account has access to things that Emily has only ever sent to Anthony and knew about events that happened to Emily when she was not a public social media influencer. So I don't think they really want to talk about Brita Filter. Part seven, the Snapchats. This is actually gonna be a kind of thick section with just more substance to talk about. Unfortunately, we are past that one glimmer of hope of Shannon and Anthony potentially making some like valid points here. To be honest with you, all of Anthony and Shannon's points in this section are weak, ill-informed, or easy to poke holes in. The story of these Snapchats is really important to this overall story, so I'm gonna recommend that you pay very close attention to every detail in this part. No shade, no shame, but after my prologue video, several people have commented with a misunderstanding of how this section goes down and the conclusion that it comes to. Which is fine because the first time that I listened to this section I also completely misunderstood the point that Shannon and Anthony were making because they are not good at being clear. So <laughs> hang in there with me and we'll get through it all and see that this is not what it looks like at first. So let's get to it. First of all, Anthony and Shannon start this section by playing some clips from Emily's video and responding to them with text on screen. As a side note, like, I don't know if you've watched this whole big old video from Anthony and Shannon, but they put so much shit on screen for like two seconds and it's just obnoxious. <laughs> like anybody who is listening to their video more than watching it, like I was like doing chores the first time I listened to it because it's a two and a half hour video. You end up missing a lot of information, which I think is a really interesting choice from people who are trying to prove their innocence. But anyway, in this moment of Emily's video, she recounts a day when she had a creepy Snapchat conversation with someone who was indicating that they were present in her town by sending her pictures of local landmarks. I was 100% convinced that this person, Andrew or Shannon or whoever, was in my city. I, And then they say, I have prolonged fits of daydreaming at times. Just this really, and I know it may not seem scary to some people, but to me, this is so messed up. I 100% believe that this person was in my city looking for me so that they could kill me. So Anthony and Shannon pop up all of these quick written responses on screen. Like I had mentioned before, Andrew and his friend Brandon discussed at length about going into their old high school and shooting it up. 
They give a few blanket denials that these conversations between Anthony and Bryce ever even happened. Although, why should I believe them? Because Shannon wasn't even there at the time, and Anthony definitely has reason to lie. They also completely idolized Heath Ledger's Joker from The Dark Knight. They, they just thought he was like the most chaotic evil, the most amazing, cool villain ever. Then when Emily is retelling these memories of hearing Anthony and Bryce having these shoot em up conversations. Andrew had discussed donning a mask, kidnapping the people who made fun of him in high school and torturing them. Shannon puts on screen, well, they couldn't drive and they had no weapons, so how could they do that? As if the practical details of how to execute something like that was the problem and not the sentiment behind it. <laughs> and as if they couldn't obtain weapons if they wanted to, like, hello. This is what was coming to the forefront of my mind when I was receiving these Snapchats. Anthony and Shannon also say, Emily still has access to Anthony's messages and all the ones she showed didn't show even a hint of this kind of aggression. So either this happened, but there is no proof because reasons, or this never happened meaning the conversations between Anthony and Bryce about going back to high school. And like, at least one sock account that is likely to be Anthony was kind of aggressive. Yeah. Do you want to be hurt in the worst possible way? My theory is that these conversations did happen and Anthony is telling Shannon that they didn't because he's lying to her and he doesn't want to look bad. And that because they were verbal conversations, um, there's no screenshots of that. Technology's not there yet. This is high key gaslighting. And I think it's being done more by Anthony than necessarily by Shannon. Now I don't have a screenshot of this, but I did send a message to him saying, do not come to my home. I have a security animal, which is 100% true. Osa is not only an emotional support dog, she is also a trained security dog. I also let him know that I have a gun in the home that I have access to and that I know how to use. And that if he tried to hurt me, that I would be forced to have to defend myself. And at this point, I had the gun. Like, I had the gun out and ready. I was fully prepared for him to come to this house and to hurt me. After Anthony and Shannon show these clips of Emily saying she was getting these weird Snapchats, they were making her scared, they were making her feel like this person was in her town, trying to find her so they could attack her. Anthony and Shannon try to pin down a timeline of when this Snapchat conversation would have happened. They say it had to happen in 2016 because Emily said she was afraid of the stalker coming to her apartment specifically. I had to listen to this section like, three times in a row because I never heard her say the word apartment and she doesn't. But there is one Snapchat where she types the word apartment in a message to whoever she was talking to. Also, since we're talking about what was said in the Snapchat messages, um, this person that Emily was talking to never denies that they are Anthony. She calls them Anthony multiple times, talks to them as though they're Anthony. They never deny that they're Anthony. They also seem very familiar with Emily's YouTube content. And they seem to write very similarly to how Anthony writes. But you know, just saying. Anyway, Anthony and Shannon propose that this whole experience must have happened in mid-November of 2016. They start out by establishing that this only could have happened in 2016, and then they narrow it down further and further until they get to mid-November of 2016. As for why it could only have happened in 2016, it's because the Snapchat conversation references Emily's art YouTube channel, which was started in 2016. And because during the conversation, she said she was living in an apartment, which she only lived in for part of 2016 before moving in with her boyfriend. So it had to have been in that window during which she was both making art YouTube videos and living in that apartment, which means a specific time during 2016. Thanks to some people over on Reddit, I have found out that these messages that were sent to Emily were actually a part of some viral marketing done for what appears to be an ARG that is now defunct. Multiple other internet personalities publicly stated they received messages in 2017 about the mind-bending, thumb-bending video. This was clearly someone trying to get interest in their ARG by harassing different content creators online so they would post the messages and get publicity. Because the other content creators who received these messages were getting these messages in 2017, it's unlikely that Emily was ever sent these messages 
in 2016, meaning that her entire story about pulling a gun in her ex-boyfriend's California apartment could not have happened, meaning it is a lie. Let me stop you right there, Shannon. No, that is not what any of that means. And let me quickly note that what I'm about to say here to explain the Snapchats is going to contradict with what I have commented to some of you in the comments having this conversation. So my apologies upon this most recent look through everything as I've been editing this video. I've made a few realizations that made it much more specific for me. So this is my final conclusion about what's going on with the Snapchats as of now. So here Shannon does something similar to what she does with the rape allegations that we've talked about already a couple of times. With the rape allegations, they focus focus in on the qualifier of whether or not Emily was high at the time that she was raped. And they decide that if they can somehow prove that she wasn't high, that's the same as proving that the whole thing never even happened. And we know that that's not true because even if Emily was not high, um, sober people can get raped too. That's not the determining factor. The same thing happens here. Shannon brings up this Reddit post and says, because of this Reddit post, I know that these messages were sent as part of this marketing campaign in 2017 and chooses the timing as the most important qualifying factor. She decides that because these messages resemble the marketing campaign, then they must have been from that marketing campaign. Although based on this DM that an influencer got in 2017 that was supposed to be part of that marketing campaign, the messages are not that similar to Emily's. Like the only similarity I can see is the use of the phrase mind bending, thumb bending. And I know it's a weird term, so it sticks out, but there's more explanations than this marketing campaign. This screenshot that Shannon includes in her own video proposes a couple of different sources for where the mind bending thumb bending video came from, including a very old video on YouTube, which they post a link to look at with the Wayback Machine. I will link that video below in my description. And the fact that it relates to an alien race in a book fandom. So it's not like this marketing campaign was the first and only time to use that term, mind bending thumb bending. But it's too late. Shannon has already decided that these messages that Emily received must have been from that marketing campaign. Therefore, they must have been sent in 2017. Therefore, Emily must have received them in 2017. When she was living in a house in Nebraska rather than an apartment in California and therefore Emily is lying about the whole entire experience specifically the part where she gets so scared that she pulls a gun and preps her attack dog. She doesn't provide a motive why Emily would do this. To Shannon it's just case closed. Nobody else could have sent these messages besides the marketing campaign. Therefore because of the timing of the marketing campaign the only option is that Emily lied. However my argument is I don't think that the timing of these messages is the most important factor. I think we're trying to determine who sent them. And like I said, the mind bending, thumb bending meme exists in other places besides this one marketing campaign. So somebody who knew about that meme could have easily sent those messages, especially because those messages were full of very specific references to Emily's life and her channel and her art and her content. That, to be honest with you, as somebody who has worked in several different small businesses, a random small ARG would not have the time to research all of that level of detail about all of these different influencers that it was going to send all these messages to. No way in hell. <laughs> don't have the time, don't have the budget for that. It had to have been sent by somebody who knew enough about her to already know those things. So I think the determining factor here is not the timing of these messages, but the source of these messages. And I do not think that they were sent from this marketing campaign in 2017. Also, just look at that writing style, man. That just screams Anthony to me. But anyway, I hope that this all makes sense. Please leave me any questions in the comments below. Sorry, I'm like kind of rushing through this section, but I don't want this video to be too long. Pause to read the Snapchats. You got it. Let's keep going. We can prove that Anthony and I had no part in this because he didn't have a phone at the time that this would have occurred and we shared mine. I have only ever had a public Snapchat, which I used to link in the description of my videos. Neither of us have ever had a Snapchat under the name Kilgore Trout and we can prove this through phone records, Apple ID, and any investigation into this would immediately clear us of all these allegations. Maybe I'm dumb, but what does phone records have to do with Snapchat? I thought Snapchat runs more over Wi-Fi? that like it's an app an app's default to wi-fi and also how does hap how does apple id prove your innocence i'm not even being like sassy and sarcastic i just genuinely don't know like tell me in the comments below i don't know 
what this stuff would do to help help prove their case. <laughs> Again, this is one of those places that I wish that they had expanded on compared to a lot of these other places where they just go on and on about shit that is unrelated and makes no fucking sense. I've said this about other influencers. Like, if you have receipts that will clear your name, show them to me. We don't want to think that you're this way. But if you don't show me this shit, then what am I supposed to think? I have to go with what's in front of me. Like, in my opinion, if this is the proof that you're telling me about, those records from third-party sources, phone records, Apple ID, whatever, is like the only way you guys can clear your name here. Because, one, Anthony absolutely could have had a secret Snapchat account that you never knew about, or could have created it just for, like, this one moment to spend a little time terrorizing Emily and then delete it and go on his merry way. The writing style just sounds so much like Anthony and they have such a detailed knowledge of Emily's YouTube and social media. Like, show me the receipts, because until I see them, I don't know who else it could be. Now I need to bring my voice down because I, I'm getting shrill in this video. I'm sorry, I've been talking for a long time. My voice is getting dry. I'm trying not to get up into the heights, but um, it gets even crazier. Anthony and Shannon reference a few times that Emily talked about talking to the police about this whole situation, both in her original video and on Twitter when she's tweeted about it a little. I went to the police. I was turned away. I spoke to an attorney. They told me it's not going to be worth it taking it to court. I even went as far as hiring a private investigator for a short period of time, and he said the same thing. The PI and the attorney advised me that I needed to start taking screenshots of everything that I could and keeping track of what was happening to me. There would be some record of this happening with law enforcement. There is not. Her stating that she was turned away by the cops goes against her claiming the police have a file on Anthony and myself, which she stated also on Twitter. She has no evidence to show this was us. Her lawyer, the police, and a private investigator told her this wasn't us, and yet she is claiming it is with no evidence. So like, two things. <laughs> One, how do you know that there's no record of anything with law enforcement? Have you been like calling all the local police stations? How do you know? What are you talking about? <laughs> How do you just say things like that with such audacity? Like, please, give me some of the audacity that you have. It overflows your audacity. But two, in terms of the police turning Emily away, like, I interpreted that to mean that they turned her away in terms of, like, they didn't feel they had enough to press charges against Anthony and Shannon or, like, put out a warrant for their arrest. Which is not the same as turning her away from submitting evidence and, like, having a file. You can keep a file on somebody and build up evidence for a long time. That's, like, that's part of how arrest works. In order to get a warrant for somebody's arrest, you need to have some sort of a cause. And part of creating that cause is building up evidence. So, pointless. Pointless. Just pointless words coming out of their mouths. Misinformed and pointless. <laughs> Finally, Anthony and Shannon say here that Emily admitted that the police, her lawyer, and a private investigator all said that it wasn't Shannon and Anthony who did these things to her. And I would like to point out, absolutely fucking not. Emily did not say any of that. First, in regards to the police. Emily said that they turned her away because it was all internet stuff. I even say here that the police turned me away because he hadn't threatened my life yet. And personally, I have had a similar experience with my local police. I haven't talked about this online before, but it seems relevant now. A few years ago, I worked with a company that was online only and turned out to be a complete scam. Yes, I'm an idiot, that's okay. I worked for them for six weeks, never got paid one penny. When I talked to my local police about it, because I didn't know what to do, they said that all they could do was call the police department that was local to my fake boss and have them send a wellness check on my fake boss because he had emailed me a couple of times about how suicidal he was because the people in his company were finding out that it was fake and everybody was abandoning him in droves. So they did that. They called the wellness check on him, which led to me getting a very interesting email from my fake boss afterward, but nothing came of it for me. It was a very underwhelming response. <laughs> Believe it or not, the government, and especially local government, like local police departments, are way behind when it comes to technology and crimes that occur over the internet. Like, whoa, I know that's like crazy stuff. It's a real hot take here. Social commentary. So yeah, 
Emily's police didn't even look into this whole situation. Maybe they have a file where they're collecting evidence, but they're not investigating it. So no, as much as they couldn't say that it was you because they weren't investigating, it would have been equally irresponsible for them to say that it was not you. So they didn't say that, Shannon and Anthony. Point two, in regards to Emily's lawyer, he said it wouldn't be worth it for her to take you guys to court. That is not the same as saying you didn't do it and saying that you have no case, which you really like to keep repeating throughout this video as if repeating it, saying it more often and more loudly and with more passion makes it more true. Emily expanded on this as well. If you would just put on your listening ears, you would know. I would just delete and block and delete and block. And finally, I consulted with a lawyer and they're like, don't do that, save everything to the best of your ability you need to save everything and after everything i consulted with the lawyer i went back to the police i even hired a private investigator for a short time to do some digging i one ran out of money and two was advised by the lawyer not to take this to court that it would be a lengthy court battle and it's not like justice will be served because it's really hard to prove that Shannon and Andrew ran all those sock puppet accounts because there was so many of them. She said it would be a lengthy court process, which means it would be expensive, and it would be very hard for them to prove that you too were behind all of these accounts because there were so many of them. For a case to be worth taking to court, there has to be a reward at the end that is worth all of the time, money, stress, emotions that go into this kind of a court case. And in this case, it's hard to determine exactly what that reward would be. But just because her case isn't worth taking to trial doesn't mean that she's wrong and doesn't mean that the lawyer cleared you of any guilt, Huns. Third, in regards to the private investigator, Emily barely talked about this person. So I dare you to find me the place where Emily said that the private investigator said it wasn't the two of you. It's not in her video. You two are just making a fuck ton of assumptions. That's what's going on here. So yeah, that was this section. It was a doozy. <laughs> and now I think it's time to take another breather. It's okay to feel frustrated by this situation. I know I feel it, and you might feel it too while you're watching this. That frustration is a good sign because it's grounded in beautiful emotions like passion for justice, sympathy for Emily, and desire for truth. Breathe out the toxicity. Breathe in positivity. And again, let's remember, we are watchers of this situation. We are not in it, so we can feel peace. Okay, let's move on. Parts 8, 9, and 10. Anthony's tweets, The Rewired Soul, and My Problem with a Big Art YouTuber. The next few sections are each pretty quick, thank God. <laughs> In part 8, Anthony's tweets, this section is honestly really like short and sweet. It's just Shannon saying that all of Anthony's tweets were written by himself, not by her, and that he was clearly joking as you could tell because of the tone. Although she does not reference which tweets she's talking about. So, okay, I <laughs> just like, I can't respond to this because there's not enough information. Part nine, the rewired soul is not really about the rewired soul at all. It's about a sock account, allegedly, <laughs> which is called Dat Boy and which Emily thinks was run by Anthony and Shannon, and it sent Emily threats and hate during the backlash around the rewired soul situation. Um, and they say, uh oh dear, looks like you're friends with a fraud. Do you want to be hurt in the worst possible way? Somebody is a bad mommy. Maybe we let everyone know how bad of a mommy you are. Keep telling people you're sober, girl. Maybe if you say it enough, people will believe it. Have fun endorsing your fraud, druggy bitch. Have fun faking your sobriety for your mindless followers. They believe you, but no one else does, my dear. You bad mommy. I've got receipts, druggy bitch, with a winky face. Emily discusses this in her video for about 10 minutes, but really for most of that time, she's explaining why she connects sock accounts like Dat Boy and others that she's talking about in these videos with 
Anthony and Shannon. One, she says that their writing styles are very similar to Shannon's and Anthony's respective writing styles, and I've gotta agree with her there. And two, all of these sock accounts kept commenting and talking to Emily about the same things. Her talking about her kids too much and being a bad mom. I'll also mention this is the type of behavior that the Brita Filter account said that their younger brother admitted to. So just saying. Emily states that she got hate from an account called Dat Boy XD and it was me. It was not me. It was also not Anthony. While I can't prove this, we could subpoena this Twitter account to show who it belongs to. It's interesting that this is the first time in this whole video that they've said that. Her stating that this account had to have been me and could have only been me is entirely false and it takes the entirety of the rewired soul situation out of context. Well, it's a damn good thing Emily didn't say that then, huh? They then completely skip over Emily's two points about all these sock accounts sounding a lot like Shannon and Anthony's writing styles and commenting on the same subject matter about her being a bad mom and stuff. And instead they just majorly deflect. For Emily to state that she got a message from someone harassing her doesn't surprise me because everyone was getting that at the time, including me. But for her to say it was unequivocally me without any evidence is just wrong. Well then it's a damn good thing she didn't say that, huh? Now we get to part 10, which Shannon called my problem with a big art YouTuber even though it's about a video by Emily called My Problem with a Big YouTuber. So she just got the title wrong. Emily talks about this in her video for about four minutes, how when she made her video called My Problem with a Big YouTuber, she was getting a lot of comments asking her if she was talking about Shannon from Creepshow Art in that video. Shannon corroborates this in her video here, saying that she got a lot of comments and DMs asking if she was the one that Emily was talking about, and both Emily and Shannon agree and corroborate that Emily was not talking about Shannon in that video. Emily does note here that there were a few legitimate real little YouTube accounts commenting and being like, hey, is this creep show art? But I would say 50% of the people saying creep show art were definitely sock puppets. She had the audacity to even use Lily Singh as a, um, like a, a handle, which I thought was weird. And she'd comment stuff like creep show art, more like crap show art, am I right? And of course, Anthony and Shannon say that this is categorically false. Emily states that I commented on this video multiple times under false names to shit talk myself and say that I was the YouTuber she was talking about. This is categorically false. I remember when the video came out, I got sent a fair amount of harassing messages saying it was me and I thought that was stupid because after I watched the video, one of the qualifications was the YouTuber who was harassing Emily had to have more subscribers than her and I had nowhere near as many subscribers as she did. We don't really have any information. We don't have any screenshots. We don't have anything to prove one way or another. So there's not much for me to say hear about this. However, Anthony and Shannon do point out that the very existence of this video by Emily, my problem with a big YouTuber, disproves Emily's earlier point that she was only ever compared to Creepshow art in her comments. In my opinion, I think that Emily was speaking in hyperbole when she said that and meant that like the vast majority and the most repeated comparison that she got was between her channel and Creepshow Arts. But like, okay, if Shannon wants this to be a win, good job, you got one. In this section, Anthony and Shannon also go off on this like side tangent. I'm gonna provide a little more context here than they provide in the moment because it's really confusing otherwise. But basically, Anthony and Shannon get real pissed because in her video, Emily shows a screenshot of an IP address and it's blurred out. Emily said in her video that it's the IP address for a public library that Anthony and Shannon visited very often when they were living in their car so that they had access to Wi-Fi. Emily also provided footage from one Creepshow art video and one of Anthony's videos, each of them talking about doing this, going to this library to use Wi-Fi. This IP address of the public library is important because it is also the IP address of somebody who was harassing Emily. I want to backtrack a little bit and talk about how I said I had undeniable proof that Andrew was the person stalking me, that he clicked a link and I was able to trace his IP because this was the first time that I had done that. Now, after the Twitter incident where Andrew accused me of supposedly buying subs, I was very suspicious that my stalker up until that point had been Andrew. So I laid out a trap where I sent one of these profiles um, a link uh, pretending to be another like separate hater of mine. And on that link, um, I attached an IP tracker. And because we had mutual friends, I knew exactly where Andrew and Shannon lived. So I sent over the bait, he clicked on the link, and wouldn't you know it, the IP address took me directly 
to where they were living. What's interesting is back when my Facebook account was hacked, I wasn't aware that Andrew was doing any of this, right? Um, but Facebook had sent me um, an, an email basically saying, um, here is where the unknown login came from. The IP address pointed to the city where Andrew was from and where he resided in at the time. To summarize and clarify, Emily is saying that Facebook emailed her an IP address when her Facebook account was hacked. And she used an IP tracker to find the IP address of one of the sock accounts that was harassing her. And it seems like they're both the same IP address because of the way that she talks about them. This is the IP address that she reveals at the end of the video, even though it's blurred over, and says that it's from the library. However, even though it was a public library, so it was a public space, Emily still felt like she should blur out the IP address because she felt like not doing so would be a form of doxing them. To Anthony and Shannon, the fact that Emily had linked this public library's IP address to the two of them is not enough proof that they were the people running the sock accounts because the library was a public space. Literally anybody could have gone in there and used a computer and run a sock account not necessarily the two of them. Therefore, to Anthony and Shannon, Emily's choice to blur out the IP address was misleading and made it look like she had more specific, more personal information on the two of them than she actually did, even though she said in that video that it's the IP address for the library. So everybody was on the same page. She shows at the end of her video that she had apparent screenshots that show it was me on the comments of the video, but she blurs out the IP as not to quote, dox me. Seeing as I didn't have a home at that time, she wouldn't have been doxing any place of residence or be doxing me at all. If the IP address led to a library, it wouldn't have doxed me and she would have simply shown it. So either she has an IP address for a library and lied to say it contained my docs, or she has an IP address that led somewhere that I never live. Either way, she lied about the IP address in my opinion, the IP address for the library is about as specific as Emily could get, considering Anthony and Shannon were living in their car at the time. Yes, technically it's circumstantial evidence. Shannon and Anthony happen to live in their car near this library. And yes, they happen to say in at least one video that they go there very often to do their work, but technically it could have been somebody else running those sock accounts from that library. However, considering everything else, motive, <laughs> opportunity, the fact that they had a relationship with Emily in the past, the content of those sock accounts and how consistently they appeared in Emily's comments and DMs. I can see why Emily would think that the IP address of one of the sock accounts being the same as the IP address of a library that Shannon and Anthony use all the time might connect the two of those things. I really don't think that Emily is like a big bad lying liar here. They make a really big fucking deal about it. I also think that if Emily had come even like slightly close to doxing Anthony and Shannon, they would have jumped on the opportunity to just like rip Emily limb from limb here. So if I was Emily, I too would rather be safe than sorry and would blur out the IP address. Woo! We're in the last quarter of the video, guys. We can do this. Yeah, okay. Part 11, Amy. Proof that she exists. This section is in response to Emily saying that she believes Shannon's story of Amy, her stalker, is completely made up and is based on the things that Shannon and Anthony were doing to Emily. Emily tried to state in her video that that video was secretly about her, that I was setting a backstory up to one day say that Emily was actually Amy and by simply calling her Amy, I was referencing her because according to her, I was trying to lay breadcrumbs online to paint her as a malicious stalker. Isn't that a kawinky dink? That right there is the most passive aggressive shit I have ever read and is also one of the many breadcrumbs that she started leaving behind that she had a quote unquote stalker named Amy. I think it's funny that she picked the name Amy. I think she deliberately picked a name that was very close to mine so that if I ever came out with allegations, she could be like, see, I even chose Amy because it sounds like Emily. And of course she picked all the things that she did to me. So then I couldn't even come out if I wanted to because then it would seem like I was copying her instead of her copying me. That is not the case. Amy is not a reference to Emily. Amy is a girl who used to harass me online who I originally met on Stardoll.com when I was in middle school. We never knew each other personally and she was someone I strictly knew online who lived states away from me. Shannon combats Emily's claims that Amy was based around the story of what Shannon and Anthony were doing to Emily by going through a few details of Amy's story and saying that they don't apply to Emily. The video I put up, which is still up, has various details that do not match with Emily. It would make no sense for me to say that Emily and I 
were friends online ever, seeing as we never knew each other outside of her being a friend of some friends and one of my ex-boyfriend's exes before I even had a crush on him. Me stating that she grew up states away from me also does not align with her being Emily, seeing as Emily went to school in California and I know people who know her. It would make no sense for that video to be about her. Personally, I don't think that these few particular details disprove Emily's point. I think that if Emily was correct and if Shannon was going to use the Amy story as a representation of Emily, she would have had to change up some details to muddy the waters so that people didn't immediately hear her tell the story of Amy and be like, wait a minute, I think that's Emily. Like what happened with Emily's video of my problem with a big YouTuber. Either way, I can totally accept the idea that Amy is real. However, Shannon's proof that she provides is weak at best. She shows screenshots of a bunch of emails that she and Amy exchanged back in middle school. And it's just like normal middle school stuff, you know, boys and stuff. But these emails do not in any way substantiate the claim that Amy was stalking Shannon for years. It just proves that the two of them existed and knew each other and spoke a little bit during middle school. Shannon has talked in several videos about having a lot of proof about Amy. So I don't know why she didn't pull any of that for this video. However, even in some of these videos where she does talk about Amy and go into some detail about her, there are some conflicting points. One of my subscribers recently left a great comment comparing these. So I'm gonna put screenshots up on the screen and you can pause to read them. It's kind of like side related to this story, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but she makes good points and good comparisons. So they're up here on the screen for you to pause and read if you're interested. So yeah, Shannon's story about Amy is all over the place and it always has been. I think that she exists in some capacity or existed, but I don't really know what's true about her. And I think that we'll never know for sure. Part 12, Emily's question. This part is dumb and petty as fuck. We're gonna go through it, but God, is it just dumb. In Emily's original video, for about 22 minutes, she goes through this long DM conversation that she has with Shannon, which turns into Emily finally confronting Shannon about the harassment she has been experiencing for years. Out of this entire long segment, Anthony and Shannon only choose to respond <laughs> to one piece. For context, during these DMs, Shannon said that she was sent a bunch of dirt on Emily by the Brita filter account, interestingly enough. And if you recall at the beginning of the conversation I had with Shannon, she did mention this account. She said this account specifically had sent her some dirt on me, but she had tried to report it, but then when she went back, they had deleted their account. Well, apparently not. She said that it was dirt on stuff that came before Emily's time as Emily Artful on YouTube, and that it made Shannon uncomfortable. Emily asked rhetorically in her video, why someone who was trying to spread this dirt and this shit about her would only send that information to Shannon and not to a lot of other commentators and drama channels because they were trying to get the story out there. The implication there being that Shannon had actually collected all of this dirt herself and was mentioning it as a veiled threat against Emily, basically. In response, Shannon says, first of all, I know for a fact Hopeless Peaches and one other art account that no longer exists also got these messages. And then secondly, and you can tell Shannon is like, Oh, I got her. I fucking got her now. In response to that assertion, if I was going to make a video on Emily because I had all this information, wouldn't I just do that? I was already making commentary content. I was already making call outs. If I wanted to cancel Emily as they say I did, I would have just made a video. And then she does it. She then goes through and shows off a bunch of screenshots of offensive shit that Emily used to say back in a time that Emily has admitted was first of all a relapse phase when she was in and out of addiction, but also secondly, where her mindset was a very like pick me girl mindset. It's like mostly a bunch of fat phobic stuff. And honestly, all of it is stuff that Emily has apologized for and continues to apologize for to this day. There's not much for me to say here. Like what? Like, do you want a dramatic slow clap? You're not proving anything here other than Emily was right. It was in fact 
a veiled threat to tell Emily that you had all that shit on her. Emily was right. Thank you very much. Case closed. What do you want? <laughs> it's just ironic because at one point in her video, Shannon accuses Emily of overthinking everything that she says and taking things as a threat that are not meant that way. Emily also states that me telling that her that someone messaged me like this and I wasn't going to do anything was my way of threatening her. Me saying I wasn't going to do something was not my way of telling her I was going to do something. Emily purposely misinterprets anything I've had to say to her to make it appear as if I'm telling her the opposite. If I tell her I understand what she's going through and I'm more than happy to sign a restraining order or any illegal documents that state I will not contact her, that means I'm engaging in psychological warfare with her and I'm using reverse psychology to say I won't actually do that. If I tell her I'm sorry for what she's going through because I know how isolating being harassed online can be, I'm actually telling her that I am one of the people doing this all along and I'm getting joy out of it. But like, didn't you just do the thing that was not technically worded as a threat, but Emily saw through it and realized that it was a threat? Are you not currently right now in this video following through on that threat and exposing all the shit that you have on Emily? Like, she was right, Jesus! Quit trying to gaslight this woman, god damn! So that's that whole section, it's the end of it. Like I said, it's fucking dumb. And <laughs> at this point in the video, Shannon and Anthony stop going through Emily's video point by point, chronologically following her timeline, and instead they veer off and start just bringing up a bunch of fucking miscellaneous points. There's still like 30 minutes left of Emily's video and they just like didn't respond to that whole last half hour of it. Remember in June of 2021 when this video first came out and there were certain commentators who didn't watch the entire thing and they stopped about a half hour from the end and everybody was like, oh my god, no, you missed it. The last half hour is the most important part. That's when Emily ties everything up neatly into a bow. Oh, it's the most important. This is because it is. And yet, Anthony and Shannon chose that section to be one of the sections they just don't respond to. I wonder why. And as a reminder, a huge part of that last half hour is Emily telling the story of the Brita Filter account. But we're not going to talk about that, are we, Anthony and Shannon? No. Instead, we're going to sidebar over here and talk about part 13, 2014. Just the year 2014. Okay, let's see what it is. In my opinion, let me just start this section, part 13, by saying, um, this section is like slightly about what the section is about and it's a lot more about what goes unsaid in this section. So excuse me if I go off a little bit at the end here, but there is some insidious shit that happens in this section that just goes untalked about. And I'm just gonna sit here and talk about it for a second. Shannon starts out this section by saying that Emily has had an issue with me since 2014. To prove this, she reads a DM conversation that she had with Anthony back then for context there was a day in 2014 when Shannon went to a music shop where Emily's boyfriend at the time worked. Shannon had a good experience and so she left a positive review about it on Facebook and it seems that Emily noticed this and messaged Anthony about it at the time they were talking still every now and then. Hence, Anthony messages Shannon with this conversation. Here are the messages. Anthony, oh, and Emily thinks you hate her. Me, why? Anthony, she messaged me something about a review online or something? About her friend's crazy ex-girlfriend who smashed a violin or something. I don't know why she would think that was you. Me, wait, what? I was gonna see how much violence cost because my friend's ex smashed his. It was going to be this whole everyone chips in to buy him a new one thing. Oddly enough, he got back together with that girl and she ended up buying him a new one. Anthony, well, she now knows you and doesn't like you. Her boyfriend works at the store you visited. Me, wait, what the hell? Anthony, yeah. You wrote a review about it? Me, I must have. Anthony, great. Well, now she thinks you hate her. Me, wait, I did. Because this girl was actually really cute and she said if we were serious, then they would do all this shit for us and be super helpful. And I was like, wow, this is actually really great. I definitely don't. How did she make that jump? Anthony, yeah, how could she make that jump? Me, I'm sorry. I just, should I tell her I don't? It really won't affect me in any way. I just don't want her wrath on me. Anthony, it doesn't matter. You're connected to her in some way, so now you hate her too. Me, I thought her boyfriend had serial killer potential. That equals hate. Anthony, was she the fucking girl in the store or something? Me, I left a nice review though, so I don't get why she's mad. Anthony, so she read a review and found out it was you. Now she thinks you hate her. Me, well then, foolproof logic. 
Anthony, so like I said, she found out you talked to her boyfriend once in a store and told a story about it online. So now we're connected in some way. You hate her. He smash. Anthony, God fucking damn it. The iPad fuck. I don't think that this conversation is proof of Emily having a problem with Shannon since 2014. I think this screenshot conversation is proof that Anthony is toxic as fuck. Let me explain. To me, there is a real toxicity in the way that Anthony talks to people, and it is evident all over this conversation here. Anthony starts this conversation by saying that Emily thinks that Shannon hates her, but by the end of the conversation, they have switched it to Emily hates Shannon. So like, what? <laughs> Those are not the same. Like if I am asking my friend if their girlfriend hates me, it is not because I hate her. It is because like I would think that like maybe did I do something to offend her? Am I worried? Am I anxious that I somehow slighted this woman? Like it doesn't have, I don't hate that person because I'm asking if they hate me. Like I genuinely, I don't know how they made this leap. But when I look at this conversation, I will note Anthony is the one in the lead. He is the one who talked to Emily, who is describing that conversation to Shannon. He is the one who says, Emily hates you. In just this one short conversation that Shannon and Anthony were kind enough to share with us again, Thank you guys, thank you for these screenshots and receipts. We can see clear as day how Anthony appears to be manipulating Shannon's perception of Emily. In my opinion, if this type of conversation is normal between Anthony and Shannon, he's probably been doing this type of manipulative shit behind the scenes for years. And let me just say, Anthony is not getting nearly enough heat for this whole situation. According to Emily, he is the one who started this whole stalking and harassing campaign. In my opinion, he actively participated in it, at least up until that weird Snapchat conversation where the writing honestly does sound a lot like Anthony. And the only reason he is not getting the backlash that he deserves is because once all of this blew up, he fucking ran for the hills, bruh. He emptied out his YouTube channel and changed its name so people wouldn't be able to find him. Thank you tipster for calling him out on that shit. And I can't find him on any other socials. So he is making Shannon, his wife, his beloved, become a shield for him to absorb every blow in this situation that he roped her into years ago. This is shitty, manipulative, and frankly pathetic behavior from any adult person. And it only makes me more convinced that he is involved and that he is exactly as manipulative and abusive as Emily claims. Now I don't say this to excuse everything that Shannon has done, but I just have to be honest, there is a part of me that thinks that based on how erratic and illogical this response video is, and how much it honestly reaches on certain things, that this video is Shannon's desperate attempt to clear their names because if she doesn't, she will face some kind of a consequence from Anthony. I have no proof of this. I am purely speculating. Please do not operate off of the assumption that what I'm saying is true. I don't know. I'm just guessing. All I know is that back when Shannon was in everybody's good graces and when she was still doing commentary, if a canceled YouTuber came back to YouTube with this bad of a response video, apology video, explanation, whatever this is, Shannon would have torn it to pieces. But now this is all she can scrape together for her own defense. And while it's not great, at least it's something. I don't know, when I think about her this way, in my mind's eye, I see her like a cornered dog, wide-eyed and angry and scared and barking and desperate and just trying anything, whatever they can do to avoid getting in trouble again. I feel desperation all over this video, not truth. And it makes me really sad to think that Shannon may be a victim here as well. Again, it does not totally excuse her behavior. But I think it would be unfair of us to overlook and undervalue Anthony's role in this whole thing. Like, I just hate that there is somebody in this situation who is accused of being an abusive boyfriend and of sexually assaulting one of the people involved. And even with this clear example of him manipulating people right in front of our eyes, nobody is talking about him. Like, call this man out. 
he needs to be held accountable as well. He is the one who is at the root of all of this toxicity, and we need to treat him as such. Part 14, History of False Claims. This section is just fucking repetitive. In this section, Anthony and Shannon spend 24 minutes repeating their earlier claims that Emily claims that all of her exes are abusive, so of course she's gonna have some sort of an abusive story about Anthony. Honestly, I don't really feel the need to dive into this because like I said, it's repetitive, they've already made this point, and it doesn't really respond to anything in Emily's video, which is the purpose of this whole video, supposedly. However, I will say that I think it's shameful <laughs> that they pull up Emily's social media accounts from when she was in a middle school, where she posted about having a massive crush on her teacher to try to prove this point. I don't think I need to explain why this does nothing to back up their point and instead just makes them look fucking sick for stooping to such a low. Let me also note that Emily said she started using heroin when she was 14. Shannon may not believe that she used any drugs until after dating Anthony, but I believe Emily's timeline of her life, not somebody else's. And as I said in my prior video, I am 0% surprised that she was posting some weird shit as a 14 year old on heroin. I am not going to hold those posts against her now, like 15 years later. Also, in these posts that they included from Emily from middle school, um, they did not redact the teacher's name or like a lot of other info. Like this whole video from Shannon and Anthony is like riddled with people's personal information, including like photos of their faces. It's really bad. Anyway, back to Shannon and Anthony trying to prove that Emily thinks all of her exes are abusive. From what Anthony and Shannon show us here, the only pattern I can see is just like how Emily handles her emotions. Everyone handles things differently. Groundbreaking, I know, hot take. It just seems like Emily just really feels really hard. She loves really hard. She gets heartbroken by breakups. She goes through a grieving process and feels and expresses a lot of emotions. And then once she's processed all of that and she's more removed from it, she can look back and say, you know what, this person wasn't so bad after all. And then she can reapproach those exes to make peace and keep a platonic friendship going. This behavior honestly is not rare among artists, and it's often the source of a lot of great songs and plays and art pieces out there in the world. Maybe Emily seems a little sensitive, and maybe her emotions during a breakup can be a little roller coaster like everybody's, but she is not outside the realm of normal behavior. And more importantly, her being a kind of emotional person does not mean that she is lying about Anthony allegedly being abusive and allegedly raping her. Part 15, Random Lies. So this section is like 19 minutes long and it's really funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, Anthony and Shannon spend a whole bunch of time on stuff that doesn't matter. And it's ironic because when Shannon and Anthony put out this video, Shannon pinned a comment that says, any comment asking, why didn't you address blank or blank or what buttmuncher75 said about you in their video with 45 views? If they didn't accuse me of literal felonies, then I, <laughs> she spells them wrong here, but then I really don't care at the moment. There's a difference between people thinking I am a dick and someone saying I committed literal crimes that are so foul, wrong foul also, that if I was seen on the street by someone and recognized, I would be assaulted. There's a reason Emily got a legal notice and other people didn't, because one thing is more serious than the other. If you can't understand that, then one day I hope there never comes a time when you can relate to this, because it's terrible. One day I hope there never comes a time when you can really... Okay. So they're only making this video to address the really important hard hitting allegations, the felonies, but they're also going to spend time on whether or not Shannon's black and orange hairstyle was inspired by Emily. Right. See, I must have missed the part where copying a hairstyle is a felony. Anyway, 
Are you ready for a list of pointless shit? I'll try to be quick here because it's all mostly irrelevant and boring. Most of this stuff is not stuff that Emily touched on in her video at all. Just saying. Okay. First, Anthony and Shannon start out this section by pointing out a few social media accounts that they believe were run by Emily. One is called Snacky Packy, which Shannon shows is full of fat phobic, homophobic, like everything phobic, pick me girl comments. At one point, Emily posted through a different account that Snacky Packy was not her, but that it was a stalker impersonating her. But but Shannon believes that it is Emily because of how similar it is to other accounts that Emily admittedly ran. However, because of how similar some of these posts are to other accounts, which I will show in just one moment, I believe this account was actually run by Emily. Couple things here. One, interesting criteria that you're using, Shannon. So, you and Anthony believe that Snacky Packy was run by Emily because the writing style and the topics are similar to other accounts that she admitted that she ran? Just like how Emily is connecting sock accounts to YouTube because of the similar writing styles and subject matter? Okay, interesting. Just wanted to check that this does count as legitimate criteria for identifying who runs certain accounts? Okay, got it. Now, two, Shanthony is not wrong here. It is fully possible that Emily did run this snacky packy account back in the day and then opened another account later and called them a stalker in order to disassociate herself from those ugly comments. Just for fun, let's assume that Anthony and Shannon are 100% right about that. It doesn't really mean anything. The screenshots that they pull from this account are from 2014 to 2015. This is after Emily dated Anthony and when she says she was cycling through these phases, of heroin use, medication-assisted sobriety, relapse, so on and so forth, and on and on. They fall under the category of shit that Emily has already acknowledged, denounced, and continually apologizes for to this day. So I don't really know why Anthony and Shannon feel the need to read off all the nasty shit from this old account. I, I, I don't know what they're trying to prove with this. Next up, Shannon moves on to when Emily said that Shannon copied her hairstyle, being half orange and half black, and had a tendency to draw women that looked like her. Shannon denies both of these claims and says that her hair choices have nothing to do with Emily, and explains the inspiration behind each art piece that Emily referenced as a comparison to herself. Okay, I have no issue with that. There's no way to really like disprove or prove somebody's inspiration with facts and evidence. And honestly, this is the least important stuff that she was accused of. So like, okay, <laughs> you can have these points if you want them. At 2.10.52, Anthony and Shannon take issue with the fact that Emily called herself a professional model during her pick me girl phase and show that all the model-ish photos that Emily took were for her music career, not a modeling career. Emily didn't talk about modeling at all in her video because it's unrelated. If Emily was still trying to live this lie now, I would care more about it, but she doesn't call herself a model. She doesn't even like show her face in most of her videos. Let's move on, let's move on. Literally doesn't fucking matter. At 2.12.05, Anthony and Shannon refute Emily's claims that Anthony only ever dated Shannon because she looks goth like Emily. I don't care about this, let's move on. At 2.13.33, they make a point that Anthony is not the only person to connect Shannon's social circle with Emily's social circle. Okay. What? From 2.13.49 to 2.15.18, Anthony and Shannon point out how Emily had said that she closed off her DMs from 2016 forward because she was so traumatized by them. But then in 2018, Emily said in a video that she does still talk to fans in the DMs. So that means that was a big fat lie. And again, I just feel like Anthony and Shannon are missing the point. As far as I know, there's not a way that you can literally physically close off your DMs on most social media apps. Like people always have a way to message you. Even if you don't open them, they can still message you. So I wouldn't be surprised if Emily every now and then did scroll through some DMs and open some that looked like nice people. God forbid, what a fucking liar. I think Emily was speaking in hyperbole here again. Let me also say, 
To this day, Emily's Instagram does say that it's closed to DMs and commissions, so I think that she wants that boundary to be there. Come on, guys. Focus on what matters, Jesus Christ. Now this last one on their list of random lies is actually pretty interesting. It's three minutes and Shannon addresses the infamous soundbite of her talking about how good of a stalker she is. Let me play a clip of this soundbite for you that I, that I recorded from somebody else's video recently. I think it was a recent Nicholas DiOrio video. So before I get started, I do have a confession to make. I am essentially me from Catfish with how fucking good I am at online stalking. <laughs> like, I'm amazing at it, guys. You have no idea. Honestly, a lot of people have tried to make me feel bad about how good I am at it, and I, I don't fucking care at this point. Like When Shannon goes and plays part of this clip in her video, because she does, Shannon goes into some further storytelling about how she uses her stalking for good, for like when her friends are in a new relationship and she goes and looks up the new boyfriend or whatever. She's prevented some people from getting into bad relationships before, and clearly she meant it as a joke. And to back up her point, she plays some TikToks of other women. Here I am talking over a compilation of TikToks making the same exact motherfucking joke as I did at the beginning of that video. Almost like it's a popular thing to say. Almost like me saying that I have massive FBI skills and I'm essentially me from Catfish isn't a fucking breadcrumb that I'm stalking someone because I feel like if I actually stalked someone, I wouldn't say that. Am I right, my dudes? No? Okay, you still think that's a thing? Great. It's a funny and popular thing to say. She's just one of the young kids making a fun young kid joke. Again, two things here. One, I personally have never liked the idea of Facebook stalking your new boyfriend or somebody else's new boyfriend or friend or coworker or boss or whatever. Call me old fashioned, but I've just never been comfortable with it because most of the time you're not gonna find some incriminating piece of dirt. You're just gonna find like some old awkward photos. And when you secretly stalk somebody on social media or you get your friend to do it or whatever, to me it feels like you're invading that person's space and you're crossing a boundary into a place that they haven't invited you yet, regardless of why you're doing so. So yeah, I've just never understood why people talk so flippantly about doing that. And like, just because other people out there have the same toxic traits that you have, doesn't mean the traits are not toxic. And number two, um, similarly, just because you referenced your stalking skills as a clearly it was a joke, that doesn't mean it's false that you're a good stalker. Jokes are usually based in reality. That's what makes them funny. And as we have seen in this here video, you are clearly good at social media research, which some would call stalking. You're not really clear in your name here, hun. Part 16 and 17, Jem Campbell and Loki Coulter. Now before we get into the next two sections about Jem Campbell and Loki Coulter, let's quickly flash back to Shannon's intro. Way back in the intro, Shannon accused both of them of coming forward to corroborate Emily's story without any evidence. She also accuses Jem of messaging her and telling her to kill herself back when Emily's video came out, accuses Loki of physically assaulting her in the past, and then says that she'll be discrediting the claims that these two people have made against her. And notably, she does nothing of the sort. So let's dive in. Part 16, Jem Campbell. Um, to be 100% honest with you guys, this section is really hard to watch. It's Shannon responding to tweets that her sibling, Jem Campbell, put out shortly after Emily's video was put out in June. In those tweets, Jem said that they witnessed Shannon using multiple accounts to harass somebody that they now know to be Emily Artful. At the time, when they asked Shannon about it, Shannon just said that it was Anthony's ex. Before we get too far into this, let me just note something. Eyewitness testimony can be used as solid evidence in a court of law, but it only counts there because the person who is testifying is under oath. And if they are found to be lying on the witness stand and breaking their oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, you know how it goes, then they themselves can be charged with crimes. Unfortunately, 
There is no such oath on Twitter. So that means there is always a chance that Jem could be lying. Because none of us were there at the time, again we find ourselves in a scenario where we just have to take people's word for it. But because of these siblings' particularly rocky relationship, I do take this with a large grain of salt. Shannon's response to Jem's tweets is very personal, so it's honestly kind of hard to listen to. It seems like Shannon and Jem unfortunately had and still have a very toxic relationship. And Shannon brings up a lot of that personal pain and baggage basically to show why Jem should not be trusted. The emotional side of me really feels for Shannon here. I rarely fight with my sister, but when I do, it is absolutely awful. I would hate for our relationship to be clouded with that type of emotion and anger. So I honestly do feel bad that this is what Shannon appears to be going through with her sibling. However, the more logical, shrewd side of me thinks that this is what Shannon wants for us to feel bad for her, and therefore to be more likely to believe her that Jem is lying about seeing her harassing Emily. That logical side of me says, Shannon, just like you pointed out in your video about Amy, it's important to note that two things can be true and not negate one another. You can have all of these painful experiences with your sibling, and at the same time, they can be telling the truth about witnessing you harassing Emily. And I wasn't there, so I don't know if they are, but you didn't provide any proof or any evidence or any screenshots or anything that would give me anything solid to stand on to say that Jem is lying. I have to go with what's in front of me. And right now, Jem is providing something and you are providing nothing. A similar theme applies to the next section about Loki as well. So let's go to part 17, Loki Coulter. And let me just stay here from the start. I know that this section is not technically called Loki Coulter. However, I will be calling it that because the other name that this section is technically called is Loki's dead name. For some reason, despite knowing that that's no longer Loki Loki's name. Shannon refers to Loki by their dead name and their wrong pronouns whenever she mentions them during this video. But Loki has made it clear what name and pronouns they go by, so that is what I will be referring to them as. Anyway, in this section we have a little bit more to talk about, and it's gonna get a little wild. Just as a warning. In this section, Shannon is responding to similar tweets that were made by her ex-friend Loki Coulter, where they say that they witnessed Shannon harassing Emily years ago when they were at college together. Loki posted this tweet thread shortly after Emily's video went live and blew up. And for some reason I've decided I should read all these screenshots, so I'm gonna do that. Feel free to pause and read them at your own pace, or if you want to skip me reading these out, you can skip ahead to this timestamp. Loki tweeted this on June 15th, 2021. I never thought I'd find myself related to a situation like this, but I am absolutely in the business of holding people accountable for their actions. So I'd like to share what I know about the situation between Creepshow Art and Emily Artful. In the interest of preventing doxing, I'm not going to include any information that might put someone in danger. But if it becomes necessary for either a court case or if things get wildly out of control, I can provide more specifics. I met Shannon my freshman year of college in 2011. We shared an English class and worked on a group project together. Outside of that, at the time, we didn't have much contact. I ended up leaving that school and attending a community college that was close to my hometown. At that school, I ended up meeting my abuser. She ended up completely separating me from my entire support group, and I lost nearly all of my friends. There was a period of a few months where my abuser and I broke up, and this is when I reconnected with Shannon. Shannon ended up at the same community college, saw me on campus, and stopped me to say hi. I was desperate to make new friends, so this seemed like a blessing. She was fine at the beginning. We'd just hang out and share music, but she became concerning very quickly. It started with her introducing me to Anthony's music. She told me that he was her ex. They were still in a sexual relationship. The way he treated her seemed very unhealthy, and I I told her as such, but Shannon was insistent that he was good for her. Imagine that, somebody thinking that Anthony was treating Shannon in an unhealthy way. Eventually she shared one of Anthony's music videos that featured Emily and told me that Emily was also Anthony's ex. Shannon told me that Emily was crazy and Anthony only kept her around because she was a good singer, among other things. For the next while, every time Shannon and I would hang out, she would fixate entirely on Emily. She would point out all of what she perceived as Emily's flaws, would talk about how all of her tattoos were related to Anthony somehow, everything she could do to put her down. Real quick sidebar, that's an interesting one to note because if you remember way back in like part one or two or something of this video, I said that they spent like a minute talking about chinchillas. <laughs> I cut that out because it didn't seem important, but um, yeah, Emily has like a chinchilla tattoo that was related to Anthony somehow, and Shannon like 
brought that up in this video, even though it's literally not related <laughs> in any way. So apparently that really is like a bug in her body that Emily has a tattoo related to Anthony. Even talked to Loki about it, so do with that what you will. I thought it was strange to fixate so much on an ex's ex, but I was desperate for anyone to help me out of the situation I was in, so I ignored a lot of the red flags. I haven't really been able to forgive myself for that, especially considering what came next. Shannon began to cyberstalk Emily, first starting by finding her YouTube page. She shared videos with me and I naively thought that was harmless and it would go no further. But Shannon started looking for her home address, her phone number, or any other info she could find. Shannon told me how she had plans to harass Emily, either by sending her letters or prank calling her home. How she planned to leave hate messages on her videos or DM her from burner accounts to spread hate. This is when I began to distance myself from Shannon. The distance led me back to my abuser, which is a different story, but one of my last interactions with Shannon was her proudly showing me that Emily had posted a video about closing her YouTube channel because of the harassment she was receiving. Emily talked about how much it hurt to lose something that was important to her, but she was so anxious and in pain from the targeted harassment that she couldn't continue. It was at that point that I began to cut Shannon off. I felt guilty since that day that I didn't do anything sooner, that I didn't go to the police with what I knew, or at least attempt to talk with Shannon to tell her what she was doing wasn't okay. But I was battling my own demons, and none of that seemed like an option. Over the years, I would occasionally receive cryptic messages from Shannon at weird hours of the night, usually just a single emoji or a strangely written greeting. This caused me to block her on most of my social media. Since then, I've deleted or rebranded my online presence to avoid my abuser. But a year ago, Shannon found all my new accounts and added me with no contact. I used this as an opportunity to confront her for what she did. Screenshots of that in the next tweet. I made it a habit to screenshot my actions because my abuser had recently begun to spread incredibly harmful rumors about me. I don't have screenshots of her response because her account has been deleted, but I requested my data from Twitter today to see if I can get it. In Loki's screenshots, you can see that they wrote to Shannon, as they said like a year prior to when they posted these tweets. Hey there, it's been a while. I'm not sure how you found me, but it's nice to see a face from my past. Glad to see you have a pretty sizable following now and have found some sort of success. I hope you're doing okay other than that. Life is pretty wild nowadays. When we last talked, we engaged in some very concerning behavior. I was in a really dark place from Victoria, who I believe they say later on is their abuser, and you were basically my only friend, so I just ignored how bad everything was, and that was very wrong of me. What began as, what appeared at the time, a fun little thing to learn more about someone you had tangential connections with, quickly developed into cyberstalking, bullying, and harassment. What happened was not okay, and I should have said something sooner. I should have said something at the time, but I didn't. And that has really weighed on me over the years. So I guess I'm saying something now. We were younger and dumber, but we still should have known better. It seems a lot of your content is focused on calling out people who have had similar behavior, and I hope that's a sign that you've changed for the better. I'd like to believe that I've changed quite a bit since we last spoke, and a whole lot has damaged me. I've made great efforts to cut off large portions of my life from when we were friends. I'm concerned. I'm very hesitant to let people into my life as it stands. I'm not accusing you of anything malicious, or that you have bad intentions. I've just got conspiracy theory brain nowadays. Victoria consistently stalked me for years after we officially broke up, and once she finally lost her last shred of contact with me, she started spreading extremely malicious lies about me so she could have some sort of control. I lost a lot because of it, and I've learned not to trust things and not believe in coincidences. It might not be a true lesson, but it is the lesson I learned. I've deleted my Facebook. I'm fairly certain I have you blocked on Instagram, which was either something Victoria had me do, or I did it as an effort to distance myself from the past slash get over the guilt. I'm not sure exactly what the reason is, but it's fair to give you an explanation. I know I've rebranded my social media presence after we stopped talking, so I feel like to find me, you'd have to be actively looking for me. Or you've been keeping tabs on me ever since, and either situation sets off a whole lot of alarms in my head. Again, I'm not accusing you of doing anything malicious. I'm accusing me of paranoia. But I am still concerned. And double again, I really genuinely hope you are doing well. It just stresses me out a whole lot to have contact with anyone from that part of my life. I'm sorry. So those are the screenshots that they shared, and I'm gonna go back to a couple of points from that message, but let's just go back to the main tweet thread now. Victoria, referenced in that screenshot, is my abuser. I use language that includes myself in the past actions because I was afraid of her targeting me, I think Shannon, not Victoria, if she hadn't changed and I just came out completely confronting her. Yeah, Shannon. Shannon's response was to brush off accountability, saying we were just dumb kids. She also insisted that she found me naturally, which didn't make sense as we had no similar circles, and I had an even smaller following back then. She immediately said she would block me so I didn't have to be concerned about her, which didn't seem like an action a guiltless person would take. I thought it was over. I didn't know how much she was doing to hurt other people. But it seems like she never really changed from when I knew her. My heart goes out to everyone she hurt and everyone who thought they could trust her. This is such a terrible situation and if anyone needs an ear, please feel free to reach out. If it becomes necessary, I can reopen my Facebook and try to download the data there as I believe I have further evidence of Shannon's behavior. But I hope this chapter can close and people can find some way to heal from the damage she's caused. So that's a lot to take in. And while it is a little bit vague, a little bit like broad brush strokes, there is some Brita filter behavior in there. And just like one point, if Loki is telling the truth, it is fascinating to see that Shannon started harassing Emily while she wasn't even dating Anthony. Like Loki says at that point, 
Emily was an ex's ex. It's just very interesting. Again, Loki is not under oath here, so we can't necessarily consider this bulletproof, rock-solid evidence. But I do lean toward believing Loki more easily than believing Jem. At the time that Jem posted their story, they were dealing with a fresh wound. If you remember, the reason that this whole situation started was because of the lolcow drama. And that drama started because Shannon doxed Jem. And certainly that comes along with a lot of hurt, anger, possible motives for vengeance, not that Jem is necessarily lying. However, Loki comes to this situation much more out of the blue, with little to gain and no motive for revenge that I can see. If anything, they say that they were trying to distance themselves from Shannon, not try to connect themselves any further. All of that being said, in response to all of that, Shannon says that she also had a very toxic relationship with Loki. She lays out all these allegations of ways that Loki had hurt her physically and emotionally. And again, it makes the emotional side of me feel really bad for her. But again, it also makes the logical side of me very suspicious of Shannon. She doesn't do anything to discredit what Loki is saying. One thing that Loki tweets I do take a little bit of issue with. In tweet number 18 out of this thread, right after sharing the screenshots of the conversation that they had with Shannon, Loki tweets, I use language that includes myself in the past actions because I was afraid of her, Shannon, targeting me if she hadn't changed and I just came out completely confronting her. So I do take a little issue with that <laughs> because of something small that happened way earlier on in Shannon's video. I'll show you that in a second, but first let's listen. At 227.18 to 228.19, Shannon says something very interesting about Loki. I don't know if Kevin himself actually did anything to Emily seeing as he was the one in my life who did know a lot about what was going on with her. He watched all her channels, but I do know he did similar things to his ex-girlfriends. Kevin would hack his girlfriend's Facebook pages or they would just log on on his accounts and he would go back into them. He'd go on their YouTube pages to see what they were posting and he would generally just fuck with everything on their pages. He did this to me a couple times, sending people Facebook messages from my account to fuck with my friendships and he blocked people on my account that he didn't want me to talk to. This is him doing it to me, like sending me messages from a different friend's account. It clearly seems like Shannon is trying to shift the blame onto Loki right here, like she did with Bryce when she was DMing Emily. And I wouldn't usually give this much weight, except for a screenshot that one of my subscribers alerted me to, thank you so much, which actually seems to somewhat corroborate Shannon's story. Earlier in Shannon's video, all the way back at 46.50 to 47.20, you can see her DMing with Anthony back on June 30th, 2013, when the video of Emily Dan dancing in a bra was getting a lot of attention. As you can see, Anthony asked me if I've seen Emily's video yet, and I said no, and then said Kevin hasn't sent me anything in a while. I say that because Kevin, aka Coulter Guys on Twitter, would watch her channel and would talk about her YouTube videos to me, knowing that Anthony used to date her. To me, this brief section of conversation, plus Shannon's explanation, says a few things. One, there's a confirmation from Shannon that the Kevin in this screenshot is the dead name for Loki Coulter, not some other Kevin. Two, it seems Loki had a history of sending stuff about Emily to Shannon, and considering the context of the conversation, it seems they would send kind of scandalous and shocking stuff. Three, it seems Anthony knew that Loki was doing this because Shannon said it so casually. It's not like Anthony was like, wait, who didn't send you what, huh? And Shannon had to explain like, oh, my friend Loki, I met him in college. Sometimes he sends me stuff about Emily. No, 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 no. <laughs> it was common knowledge between the two of them that Loki used to do this. And four, if Loki used to regularly send stuff about Emily to Shannon, that implies one of two things to me. Either A, they showed Shannon this stuff with relatively harmless, like petty intent so they could just like gossip about it. Or B, they showed Shannon this stuff because Shannon had requested it. And again, considering the context of the conversation, seems likely could be number B there. It seems that as of June 30th, 2013, Shannon had enough interest in Emily's activities that she had a whole other human being sending her stuff about Emily pretty regularly. And of course, I'm speculating here, but it seems to me it's possible that Loki didn't just witness Shannon harassing Emily, they may have participated in it as well. And it opens up a bunch of questions for me, like did Shannon have help from Loki in collecting compromising information about 
about Emily all the way back since 2013? Were they maybe involved in some of the earlier harassment, like hacking Emily's Facebook page and making the photo bucket account, the stuff that Britta Filter does not actually mention, so we can't necessarily connect it to Anthony and Shannon, but that we know that Emily did experience in some way? Like, in the words of Emily D. Baker, I have questions. I'm not here to accuse Loki of anything because it seems like they've grown and changed and taken accountability compared to their past actions, but I would love to hear some clarification from them on this because it's important to the overall story, especially the timeline of when Shannon started this harassment campaign against Emily. Unfortunately, based on these tweets, it looks like Loki is not going to be saying anything else about this situation, at least not on this Twitter account. So unless and until they decide to speak more about this, I kind of have to include them as at least a potential accomplice. But please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I absolutely may be missing some pieces of this puzzle here. I would love to hear opinions about this. Part 18. Final statement. Thank God. Anthony and Shannon's final statement is just Shannon saying she's not coming back to YouTube. They feel that there is no evidence that they did this and plenty of evidence that they did not. Shannon tells off Tipster rather harshly, which I did address in my previous video on this topic. She says that her followers that messaged her and said they didn't care if she did do it, they would still follow her. She says that those people are weird. And to be honest with you, I do agree with her on that point. Everybody else should go touch some grass and she is fucking done. So there's not really much for me to say about that other than the end i guess it was kind of a sudden and unceremonious ending so let me give you my final thoughts here at the end my final thoughts so that was exhausting and more time consuming than i thought it would be to watch both of these women's gigantic videos and analyze them compare my notes script this video film this video edit this video and honestly, I'm pretty sure that watching this video is exhausting as well. So why are we all here? Why are we doing this? Why are we discussing this absolutely bonkers, off the wall situation between grown adults that doesn't involve us and doesn't impact our daily lives in any way? This drama situation is unique from others in that way where it's not occurring between a creator and their audience, it occurred privately between two creators, completely behind the scenes until Emily brought it public because she had to. I don't think there was gonna be a way for them to resolve it privately between themselves. We are not in this situation. We are just watchers of it. But why are we watching it in the first place? I have a theory as to why. I was a fan of Creepshow Art before all of this happened. I wasn't a stan, like I didn't love all of her videos, because I often felt that her commentary was sometimes shallow, sometimes condescending, sometimes repetitive. But whenever a story broke that I was interested in, I would usually listen to her take on it because she was fun to listen to when I was in the right mood. So I guess I had an overall positive opinion about her. And I wasn't alone in feeling that way. She had hundreds of thousands of subscribers who all thought that she was trying to be on the right side of history and call out wrongdoing where she saw it. And sure, there were rumors about her, but she always had an explanation. Plus, she was friends with creators that I trust, like Smoky Glow and Ready to Glare and Emily D. Baker. And honestly, they're all more shrewd than I am. So if they trusted her, so could I. It was easy for me to put on my blinders and trust her word over the objections of creators that I didn't know. Because of these blinders, it was a complete surprise to me to see this trusted right fighter in the community suddenly being called out for such blatantly bad behavior in the lolcow scandal. To see undeniable evidence that she was the person saying these nasty things. To see several YouTubers that I loved get so hurt by Shannon in that situation. And then to have this absolutely wild stalking and harassment situation piled on top of it, like this situation that I never could have dreamed of. It was a glass shattering week to say the least. I think most of Shannon's fans were in shock from this. And I just want to take a second to destigmatize that feeling here. Parasocial relationships are a very real thing. 
When influencers that we look up to, trust, relate to, feel impacted by, make part of our schedules, give our time and sometimes our money to, are suddenly revealed to be the opposite of what they portrayed and therefore the opposite of what we believe in. It should be shocking. When the curtain is pulled back and the man behind it is revealed, the confusion, betrayal, and loss that result from that are absolutely valid. And if that's how Shannon's actions made you feel, or any other influencer's scandalous, terrible actions, it's okay to admit that to yourself, to acknowledge it, and to allow yourself to feel it. Those emotions do not make you weak or stupid. They make you human. These upset feelings were only exacerbated by Shannon's lack of response to this very messy situation. The few responses that she did give really deflected and shifted blame onto others, even when hard evidence existed that it was her. And then on December 31st, when she finally came out with this response, the runtime was intimidating and the tone was off-putting. To watch it was to jump into a pool of angry, chaotic information overload. She talked at a thousand miles an hour and popped up screenshot after screenshot that seemed kind of related to eventually making a point that she was trying to get around to, but it's taking her a while to get there and now I'm just kind of lost in the sauce. It focused on the wrong things. It put words in Emily's mouth. It did not explain the things that needed explaining and it only added fuel to the fire of confusion and disappointment. I think that those unresolved feelings are what led people to videos like mine. We were all seeking some very important answers from Shannon and we simply didn't get them. Here at the tumultuous end of our collective parasocial relationship with Creepshow Art, we are all looking for closure. So I truly hope that my video has helped give you some of that closure. I hope that my analysis and opinions have helped to answer some questions and settle some emotions. And hey, if you have any more questions or emotions, please leave them in the comments below, as well as any points you want to make that maybe I missed, alternative opinions and perspectives you want to offer. My channel is a discussion channel, so please, I would love to discuss. I want to give you a huge thank you if you made it here to the end of this long and arduous video. A special thank you to those of you who liked the video, who subscribed to my channel, set my notifications to all. I post on this channel pretty sporadically, so no guarantees on when my next video will be. But with all the support I've been getting recently, I will definitely be posting here more than I planned to for this year. One more thing, I want your take on this, and I know this is risky, but just forgive me and just hear me out. Um, I'm going back to college this spring, starting January 31st, woohoo! And it's interesting and ironic that, of course, <laughs> my channel is starting to gain traction at this very transitional point in my life. I really want to be able to cover the stories that you guys want to hear about and go to a level of depth, maybe not this deep, <laughs> but... <laughs> to give you my perspective in an educated, well-rounded way. But my friends, once school starts on January 31st, with my full-time job and my other channel, I will have no time for the amount of depth that this type of video required. What I meant to say here is something in my schedule has got to go. And basically, if I'm making more money from this channel, then I can afford to spend more time on it. All of that to say, I have been very cautiously, quietly, slowly batting around the idea in my head of starting a Patreon. Maybe my patrons could vote on the video topics that I cover. We could do live streams to talk about what's happening on YouTube, like right in the moment. We could also make it a place to collect receipts and screenshots and proof of various things, because honestly, I have a Twitter, but I don't use it and I really don't want to. <laughs> like I know a lot of stuff goes down there, but that's exactly why I don't want to use it. I don't know, what do you think about me starting a Patreon? No pressure, just maybe leave a comment below about any thoughts you might have about it. What would you want a Patreon experience from me to look like? Pricing ideas, content. I've never run a Patreon before, so I don't want to just like rush into it and then end up disappointing you guys. But if I get enough interest, I might start one. I'm just kind of like 
thinking about it, you know? Anyway, thank you all again so much for watching this very long, very important feeling video. Again, reminder, please do not send any hate to anybody that I mentioned in this video. We are not gonna go and spread the same kind of vitriol that we're calling out here, right? We're gonna be above it, we're gonna be better than it, we're not gonna participate in it, okay? You and me, pinkies, promise, no hate spreading. I'll see you again soon for another video. Check my description for sources that I used for this video. Check pinned comments for corrections or clarifications that I might need to make. And I'm pretty sure that's it. So thank you for watching. Um, peace be with you. Always. <laughs> Bye.